Uh, good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014. Can I remind all those present uh, if they would please uh, switch off their electronic devices, particularly the mobile phones, because they do interfere with the broadcasting system. Um, uh, the first item is whether to consider items four and five uh, at this meeting in private and whether to consider our work programme and draft report on the draft budget in private at future meetings. Are members agreed? Uh, that's agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, today we'll hear evidence as part of our scrutiny on the Scottish Government's uh, draft budget for 2015-16, which is focusing on school spending. We'll hear evidence from two panels of witnesses today, starting with the Association of Directors of Education for Scotland and COSLA, after which we'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning and the Minister for Local Government and Planning. Um, can I welcome to the committee this morning uh, John Stodzer, the General Secretary, Association of Directors of Education in Scotland. Good morning. And yeah. Councillor Douglas Chapman, Spokesperson for Education, Children and Young People, COSLA. And uh, Robert Nicholl, Chief Officer, Children and Young People Team, COSLA. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, thank you very much for your written submissions, which the committee uh, have been uh, looking at, I'm sure, over the weekend. Uh, very useful in setting out the views of, of both of you. Uh, we have quite a lot to get through today. I, I'm going to move straight to questions from members. But before I do that, I should indicate, of course, that um, I will be suspending at 10.45 um, uh, so that members can go down to the garden lobby to take part in the Remembrance Day uh, commemoration uh, event in the garden lobby. So um, we will be concluding your evidence uh, between now and 10.45. And 10.45, uh, just to let you know that we will be bringing you back after the... Uh, the suspension. But uh, thank you very much for uh, for your forbearance in that. And I'm going to begin uh, the questioning this morning with uh, Jane Baxter. Thank you. Morning. Um, looking at the, the, the evidence that's been submitted, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the expected cuts in 2015-16. Um, COSLA submission acknowledged that there are internal and external pressures on education budgets and ADAS said that there are no easy reductions that can be made and that all of the efficiency or easy reductions have already been taken. So with that in mind, um, do ADES or COSLA have a picture of the developing situation for education budgets in local authorities in 2015-16? Yes, uh, the association <coughs> works on the basis of networks. So all of our members are part of our network and the networks cover our business. <laughs> One of the networks is dedicated to resources. So on a confidential basis, we meet regularly. So we hear from directors and from colleagues. We're not just directors. We have other tiers of the kinds of things that are being actively contemplated for, for the draft budget. So I can give you examples of the areas that are, that are being looked at. So it starts with admin and management uh, in the centre. Those services that support schools, business services, for example, that help them with their budgets and, and their clerical and admin. Curriculum development, staff development, staff improvement, that whole area of the, the quality improvement end of the business. So reductions in the number of officers uh, doing this. And this is, a, this is a continuing trend. It's not a new thing. Uh, less, less cover for, for schools. Sometimes the actual staffing arrangements will become less generous in terms of their flexibility and their, their ability to cover. Management structures in secondary schools and in primary schools perhaps being reduced. Uh, transport, cleaning, catering, maintenance, classroom assistance, auxiliaries, pupil support, devolved budgets. There isn't a single budget in the education service that is not being considered somewhere for a potential reduction. Uh, and, and that's an interesting phenomenon because what you're getting is a little bit from everything. Uh, whereas I think our view is that it may be time to take a step back and look at the whole system across Scotland with partners to see whether there are maybe single big decisions rather than many, many, many small ones, which in our view have the effect of making the system more disparate and, and more difficult to actually see the, the effects of the reductions. Douglas? Yeah, yeah I mean... Uh I think a lot of what John John said is, is probably some of the, the difficult decisions that councils will have to, to make, uh, and that is across not just through education, but um, you know there's a, 
a sense that there's pressures on other budgets uh, uh, as well. Uh, so that has a knock-on effect. But I mean, the very fact that education makes up such a, a large percent percentage of the local authority spend, uh, and most of that is already taken up by teachers' wages, terms and conditions, and so on. Uh, and added to that, you've also got the, the, the obvious um, uh, pressure of maintaining a, a large school estate across the length and breadth of Scotland. So, you know, these these are the, the, the some of the difficulties I think that councils face. I don't. I think you're right in your preamble in your, in your question. There, there will not be any any easy answers to this. Uh, but it's how we maybe start to look at how you know the the. the this education service is, is delivered uh, across the across the each local authority, and, and at the end of the day, each local authority needs to come to its own conclusions about what these savings are, uh, look like. I think the other thing as well is how how do you involve um, you know the wider public in in, in that process as well, uh, and what you know obviously everybody's got a stake in making sure that education is delivered to the highest standard possible, and I think we've got a good track record in Scotland, but nevertheless the um, you know the, the the pressures that are there, and we know there's there's more pain, financial pain coming down the tracks. So it's how we prepare ourselves for that um, going forward as well. But I mean, I, I think as far as local authorities are concerned, there's probably not a lot off the agenda at the moment, and they're looking at a whole range of things. Whether these will actually transform into actual savings or efficiencies or cuts is another matter. But they're out for consultation at the moment. And are we looking at efficiencies, or are we looking at actual cash reductions? Um, next year, I, I think for for next year the the the, the, the budget is uh, is fairly um, uh, is looking okay. I think, but I think that the, a lot of authorities are looking at the the years beyond that as well, and trying to prepare that ground to make sure that the the, the, the savings can be implemented in, in later years. Because sometimes it's not always that even if you make a decision this year, uh, sometimes. Uh, there's a gap between that and actually the, the savings coming through. So, you know, you need to prepare that in advance. And what impact will this um, previous budgetary decisions have on pupils? Can, can either of you give a few examples of how this is impacting on pupils' experience of, of the education system? Well, there are, there are some areas where there will be impact on at least some families. So some authorities are looking at things like some of the support activities that go around the school. They might not be central to the teaching and learning in the classroom, but things like uh, maybe after school clubs, breakfast clubs, some of the support activity, uh, sports and leisure, the, these kind of support activities. Some authorities are even looking at uh, what happens on the way to school. So uh, school crossing patrollers are, are being looked at. Then more directly, there is a kind of indirect impact in that teachers report that there is less support generally from from the centre. So if they're doing improvement activities, and some of the improvement activities relate to individual pupils or groups of pupils, there is just less time to do that. So for example, they had a very good example in, in a school where they, they, had, they had an improvement project, part of which was individual counselling for certain pupils and it was to do with their work. It was setting individuals down, giving them targets, and it was taking maybe 15 minutes per day. And in the first year, they had very significant results, uh, and it was focusing on literacy and numeracy. But because of both reductions in budgets and, and cover, and also because of the lack of uh, supply teachers that were able to get in, the management time in the, re in the school had been significantly reduced. The teachers, the, the, the deputy head and head teacher, were, were now all class committed, so that is kind of in abeyance for a year. So although we're not able to say, well, this goes directly into the heart of what teachers do, it does affect their working time, it does affect management time. They feel under more pressure because there's less support, and that reduces their capacity in terms of multi-agency working and making the changes that everybody's committed to, which is trying to reduce the, the, the significant gap between the people who succeed in the system and those who traditionally have not succeeded in the system. So it does, in our view, have an impact. It's it's easy to think that there's, there's back room and there's front line, but in an education service, these things are very much integrated. So teacher numbers is you know relates to all sorts of other things, people support and, and other types of staff in the school, work, working in the school. Douglas? 
just on the, um, the the comment you made about pupils, and I think some of the, the evidence you've you've taken uh, to date maybe looks at other other groups um, other than other than pupils, and I think the great strength of local authorities is that uh, you know local councillors make decisions on the budgets, and they make them. In with the, the the main thing in mind, that how do we actually protect the services that are there locally? How do we actually support pupils as best we can, given some of the, the budget cuts that are facing us? And I think that's one of the, the, the you know, the, the, the issues we keep, should keep our, our our minds on. And we do locally uh, within councils. I think that the the you know how we do we provide that service for the people and, and try and support them even against uh, you know some some difficult decisions that need need to be made. Uh, and again, I'll take some of the points that John's made as well. Uh, you know, these are some of the examples that, uh, you know, the, the, the impact of, of these decisions. But you try and mitigate these as best you can, try and work smarter within the council. Uh, for example, we heard yesterday um, about three councils working together to deliver uh, language training, um, um, Perth and Ross, uh, Dundee and, and Angus. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's different ways to... It, it, doing the, or providing the same level of service. Uh, it's just that you need to think differently about how that service is delivered sometimes to get the savings or squeeze the savings out of the, out of the system. And so at the end of the day, the people should be none the wiser that there's, there's cuts in a way. Um, but that's, a, that's a quite a difficult trick to pull off. Thank you. Thanks, Gavina. Thank you. Just before I bring in Neil, can I just clarify, because it's a question that Jane Baxter just asked there um, about the evidence from ADIS, which in the very first line says um, education services were required to make significant further savings over the coming years of the order of several percent of current spend. Um, I just want to clarify whether, what you mean by that. Do you mean effectively that uh, um, inflation will have that effect? Is that what you mean by the, current, the several percent? Or do you mean uh, actually less cash? When, Is it a real when, terms problem or a cash? When it comes down to the education service, the, the inflationary issues are all built in. So within the council, you're told you have a target to, to reach and that will include any inflationary pressures. So it could this year be in, in the information we have, which is sketchy and, and not entirely reliable at the moment until these things are finalised. So you're looking at between 2% was the smallest one I saw and maybe up towards 6% in, in, in a single year. So in a sense, as a director, that's what you're presented with, right? We're looking for you John, if I am the director in the case, for something like a 6% reduction, and you then have to produce papers, scenarios, ideas of where you might find that, and that starts the kind of corporate process of, of how you reach the final decision. So the inflationary element will be, will be built into that. Can I clarify whether or not that's part of that is the 3% efficiency savings that local authorities are required yeah. to make Yes, but, I mean, but, but those are kept, obviously, by local authorities. Well, Douglas might be in a better position. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you it from the point of view of the education authority side and, and what, what you have to deal with. You have to deal with that kind of percentage reduction. I guess all those efficiencies and, and inflationary will all be built in by the time directors get their, their target for, okay, for savings. I'm, well, I'll come, I'll come to, come to Douglas or Robert. I can try and, can try and help. Um, obviously, a, a council has to budget in the round, and there'll be pressures right across the local, local authority. I mean, we've highlighted in our submission that because education is such a, a large part of what a local authority spends, it, it has ripple effects across the authority and vice versa. So, um, you know, it will have impact on other services not related to education and, and something like older people's care will have implications for, um, for education spend. So clearly when an authority is trying to budget right across the thing, it will have a uh, an idea of the savings it wants to make right across the authority, um, and some of that will have to be passed to the um, to the education service in, a, in, in, the, in the way that it's been described by uh, by John. But the, the council will try and budget for the whole the whole of its budget. It's legally required to set a balanced budget. Um, and will then factor in the efficiency savings that it has to make to to allow that to um, to happen. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to clarify whether or not there will be. Excuse me if I'm if you're 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 answering the question, but I'm not still not clear if there will be if your expectation is that there will be uh, cuts in the amount of cash that uh, education gets, 
or it will just be based on a, a, a standstill cash budget, therefore it's the inflation we're talking about. And the reason I'm asking, just yeah. so we're absolutely clear, is that the, the draft budget is a standstill budget yeah. in cash terms. Yeah. Maybe if I can work down from that then, and, and, and others can chip in if need be. They, they can't, you're right in the sense of it's, it is a standstill budget for 15-16. However, once that's decided within the authority, the authority will decide what amount of money will be um, allocated to individual uh, individual services, and that's a, lo a local planning matter, depending on a, a great n number of different um, different factors. At the same time, the authority will know across the piece what savings it will have to deliver to meet all its obligations and um, and meet the quality of service that it, that, that it wants. So, yes, the standstill, there is a standstill budget for 15-16. However, that doesn't mean there aren't significant financial pressures right across the authority that they'll have to factor in. Can I, can I maybe add to that? Th th this is the single point that came up every year. I, as when I was director for 10 years in Aberdeen, the difference between what happens at the national level, where it looks you know, reasonably, reasonably OK, and what happens when it comes down to the education service. The, the, the two issues are, firstly, there's, there are contracts that authorities will be engaged in, for example, PPP contracts. Often these contracts have an inflationary element built into them. Sometimes the inflationary element is bigger than actual inflation. So there, there's a whole element of increased costs, which when you do nothing, so on a, on a standstill budget, you're down because, as you say, there are inflationary charges. Some of these are unavoidable. Uh, there's also new burdens. There's, there's a set of new burdens in the settlement. And when you combine both the new burdens and the the inflationary element, and when it gets down to you, you're the service, you know, receiving the budget, then it is a reduction. It's a reduction in the amount of money you have to spend on the service. Uh, so, you, so you it's not a reduction in the amount of money that you have to spend. It is. I think we just agreed that the actual settlement is, uh, in cash terms, is a standstill budget. I'm you may have to spend it on more things, which I think is what you're saying. When, di when directors are given a budget, the budget is reduced from the budget they had last year. And within that, they have to do more with it. That's, that's the reality. Right. Now we're getting down to what I was trying to get a hold of. This, this, the budget that's provided by the Scottish Government is, um, in, in cash terms, the same as last year. That's the draft budget. What I'm trying to get out is, is are local authorities then deciding that education will suffer a cash terms budget cut? I think what Robert's explained is that all services are, re are experiencing reductions. What, what? I think they would be helpful. Look, uh, the, the, uh, in pa years gone past, I think a lot of local authorities have tried to protect education because they, they, val they valued that as a, as, a, as a key service. And I think what John um, and Robert are saying is that you know, we're, we're now at a stage where it's very difficult to actually offer that level of protection as much as we would want to do. Uh, because there are other democratic pressures, uh, not democratic, uh, demographic pressures, uh, for instance, people growing older and needing more care and so on. So there's, there's other pressures from other, other parts of the services we deliver um, that are, are making, protecting that, that education budget much more difficult. And I think that's, uh, that's some of the, the, the issues behind it as well. Thank you. Uh, Neil. Um, obviously, the pen... Obviously, there are the, the pressures on, on on budgets, and even if there's a standstill in cash terms, that, that means there's real terms cuts uh, when factored in, in inflation. Um, obviously, we'll talk about various different impacts on the education budget, but I just wanted to ask firstly about teacher numbers. Um, understand, cause the Scottish government and unions are in discussion about um, teacher numbers. Can I ask what would be um, what is the likely impact on teacher numbers from um, from the budget this year, and what would uh, be the impact of a decrease in teacher numbers on the education system, and what would be an impact? What would be the impact of an increase in teacher numbers on the education system? The first number. Yeah. Um, I, I think first of all, the, the the agreement we have with Scottish government is that we say we would maintain. Um, a, 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 a level of teachers, um, teacher numbers at the moment that would uh, ensure that the ratio um, teachers to, to pupils was remained remained roughly the same. Um, the 
you know, one of the things about having uh, an agreement around teacher numbers being that the, we have had a stable workforce over over a, a period of time. Um, however, uh, I, I suppose in terms of uh, moving forward, it's always been the view of COSLA uh, that we um, start to measure things, not, not just in terms of uh, what we're putting into the system, but what are the outputs, what are the results uh, of uh, the activities that happen in schools. And that's that's roughly where we're, we're trying to take the, 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 the debate at the moment. Uh, so we're trying to move away from um, what are probably fairly um, crude input measures in, into looking more at what the what the outcomes might be uh, in terms of teacher teacher numbers if there was a, a reduction then you know probably John's in a, probably a better position given his experience uh, to give you some background on that but obviously the the, the 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 impact would be that you're looking at maybe larger classes uh, across some some uh, subjects um, and whether there's a a direct link between uh, that are falling teacher numbers and maintaining the, the level of attainment that you would want to see or an improvement in attainment, then I think the, probably the jury's out on that one. But nevertheless, the, the, it would have an impact in terms of teachers' well, I'm sure. Yeah, there would be two effects of reduced teacher numbers. One would be larger classes in primary. Uh, because there's so many primary schools, it might be one, one or two in, in pupils that we're talking about acro across, on average, across a piece. In secondaries, it would probably mean reduced subject choice when it comes to S3 and uh, past the, the broad general education. Those are those are the two, the two effects that I've practically you know managed both in reductions and in, in, in increased terms. That that's what happens when you reduce the, the teacher number in, in an authority. To that. Is, is do local authorities have enough resources to maintain teacher numbers at current levels? Well, they they are committed to it. Uh, they're, they're, it's a political question. They they are committed to it in terms of the the agreement through COSLA. So it is a political issue. Uh, they they uh, they will maintain them in so far as they they are able. I mean, the the survey is conducted every I think it's September, and I think we're yeah. due to be more or less on track for when the results are announced in December. So we we're hoping to. To make sure that that the, the current agreement um, is is as agreed to uh, is is delivered. Yeah. There's there's two elements to this. One is this year, which we have a, an outstanding agreement with with government, and we'll know in December whether we've achieved that or not. The second part is what happens in future years, and that's the work that we've highlighted in the in the the, the submission that has just um, that has just begun. But I think on your your question about impacts on reductions or increases, I suppose it has to be thought of in, in the previous conversation as to how you budget and the rounds. So if you if you re reduce one thing, that gives you more money to spend elsewhere. So as as John was saying, there there are a range of things wider than just teacher employment that have a bearing on education. Education. So clearly, there is a knock-on impact there as well. So there's an agreement for this year, 2014-15. Yes. But for the the year, obviously, we're looking at the draft budget for 2015-16. Yeah. There is not an agreement as yet for teacher numbers. Not as that. yet, no. We've got okay. some work to carry out first. Okay, that just to be clear, that was good. Um, in terms of, did you hear the concerns of the EIS last week when we were talking about there was a real possibility that children could regularly be sent home because of a lack of teaching supply? Is that is that something that that is of concern to to ADS or, or COSLA? In terms of teaching supply? A know, lack of that. teaching supply resulting in the, the, the real possibility of children being sent home from school because of a lack of teachers? Um, the, I mean, if we're talking about actual supply teachers, I don't know if that's what your, your question is aimed at. But if there's no teachers to teach the kids, obviously, yeah. if there's a lack of supply to cover any absences, that would obviously result... In that scenario, well, we're, we're nowhere near that that position at the moment. The, the, you know, we've got an agreement for this year. Uh, we're, we're working on an agreement for for next year, uh, so there's no indication that that would be the case. But the the you know the, the, we're, we're taking some time out. I, mean, I think over the next yeah. four or five months to actually work out with the Scottish government what that agreement might look like. Uh, and from our point of view, we want it to mo look more like uh, what the what the outcomes for pupils are and how we measure that rather than you know, over attainment and achievement. So you know, how does that look in, in terms of the, the, the overall uh, 
the settlement, can it be linked to the settlement? These are all the questions that we are discussing at the moment, and uh, Robert and other officers are representing COSLA in that, and we're hoping to come to an agreement before the, the, the end of this financial year. So the, at the moment, we are where we are in terms of teacher numbers, and there, there's, there's no change to that at the moment. I think, the <coughs> Barney, I think the concern raised might have referred specifically to supply yep. staff, and there are parts of the country, as you know, that are experiencing real difficulty in, in having sufficient supply staff when they need them. And there is a period between November and the end of February when, and it's always been the case that uh, the, you know, there's a potential for illnesses, for flu epidemics and so on, that, that really put a strain on the, the, the numbers available. But it's a very difficult balancing act to pull off to produce enough teachers to fill all the, the vacancies, but also have just enough slack to have on the relief register without creating a, an issue of teacher unemployment. And the Scottish Government have, have managed to pull off that balancing act for, for a number of years. And it, it's, it involves an extremely sophisticated, <coughs> complex teacher planning model, which predicts and tries to model all of the factors involved in the supply end of the chain, but what it can't really do is predict people's behaviour in terms of the you know the, the, the family decisions they make to, to move or not to move across Scotland, or indeed council's behaviour when it comes to this kind of situation and, and budget decisions. So there are areas that are, that are experiencing difficulties. The government have taken action to ensure that the supply end is, is is turned up a bit now, even even beyond what they might predict or expect. So I think it will be a, a temporary arrangement. In terms of sending classes home, then teachers obviously use their discretion and uh, try to avoid that where possible. Uh, so they would go beyond what they're kind of obliged to do in order to avoid that happening. But I'm sure there will, I'm sure there might well be situations come February if there's a flu epidemic when head teachers are having to consider what the position is if they don't have enough staff or if there's a, a very heavy snowfall which is quite common in the in the northeast where I'm from. There's just another question supply as well. As part of the um, agreement, pay agreement we had uh, agreed to last summer uh, with EIS and other trade unions, uh, part of that deal was that we would look specifically at um, the issues around supply because we knew that there were some pinch points in the, in the system. Um, either subject-based or, or, or geographically uh, based. Um, and we set up a, a working party at that time, uh, and that sh is due to report to, towards the end of the year, early next year, on some of the, the actions that local authorities will take, um, either jointly um, or in conjunction with trade unions, to make sure that we actually have a, a more seamless uh, system and people who actually want to be involved in supply can maybe find a, a wider range of work across maybe a few local authorities instead of just focusing on um, the one. I think maybe there's another some maybe West of Scotland members here who, who whose um, constituencies are, are, are fairly close in terms of the, the council boundaries. So, you know, I think there's been a difficulty before in terms of people moving from one, being supplying one local authority and moving across the boundary to somewhere else. So it's how we actually make that, that system a bit more joined up so that we can take advantage of all the, the teachers who want to uh, be on a supply list to make sure that we use the resources we do have uh, to best effect and hopefully the recommendations from that, that working party will, will, will be with you quite soon. We've, we've obviously had concerns about the impact on uh, teacher numbers from the cuts, but ADS have already mentioned other areas that have been looked at in terms of looking for efficiency savings, extracurricular activities like sports clubs and, 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 and things like that. Um, Last week we heard concerns from parents' organisations about the hidden costs related to the curriculum and um, the education uh, experience, whether it be extra charges for music tuition or school uh, trips or the need to fundraise more in schools. What, what is your response to the, the concerns of parents last week in relation to the costs or the increased costs that they see um, happening to provide that extra curricula? and um, uh, that school experience and the impact that that has, particularly on deprived areas um, where, where schools' fundraising efforts can, can sometimes not match those of, of more affluent areas. Yeah, certainly if we deal with music services, there are certainly some authorities, again, considering increasing charges on 
music services, music tuition. Uh, the research, of course, is mixed about whether this has a negative or a positive impact because uh, some of the highest charging authorities actually have the highest uptake. Uh, so it's, it's, there's, not a, there's not a direct relationship, ironically, between uh, charging and uptake. Uh, and most authorities have some kind of remission scheme or support scheme for families that, that can't afford it and who have maybe two children doing it and so on. So that, that's a specific issue, but it's a, it's a good example of where authorities begin to look for savings. They look at the core and the statutory on the one hand, and then on the other side of the page, they look at all the issues that they're not legally obliged to do, which are discretionary services and things like your after-school clubs or your your study support or uh, music would, would fall into that category. So naturally, if if two-thirds of the budget is protected and you're looking for a 6% saving, then you're looking at 18% in the remaining third. So all these things come sharply into focus. Uh, the question was, how does it impact on parents? I, I, I actually think it would be a mistake to, to say or to believe that Parents have suddenly been asked for for money because they've they've always contributed to the to the education system. Certainly in terms of school trips, uh, small amounts for maybe materials for home economics, CDT, and so on. Uh, they've always uh, maybe had a, a special fund. The school fund might look at whiteboards or some new piece of equipment. I'd, I'd accept that they do. Um, they have made contributions. I think they were saying there was an increased burden. In, I'm, in the... I'm not aware of that. It may well be, but but. But there is all, and there's always been an issue about some schools, and, and as I say, I, I worked in Aberdeen where we had where we had some of the uh, you know most advantaged areas in the whole of Scotland, but also some of the ten percent worst uh, uh, areas in terms of poverty. Uh, there was there's always been an issue that some schools can raise money, and in certainly in Aberdeen there were special schools attached to hospitals that could raise significant amounts of money. Uh, and in fact, sometimes it was actually quite embarrassing the amount of money that big companies were prepared to put into to special schools uh, in particular. So th th there is an issue about a, a lack of equity when people are, are volunteering money or, or, or giving money on a, on a voluntary basis. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure it's, it, 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 it is disadvantageous to, to families that, that, that don't have money. Do you add, Douglas, at this point? Um, I mean, I think we all appreciate that, that a lot of families and family budgets are under uh, excessive pressure at the moment as well. So it's not just local, <laughs> not just local authorities and government, um, but the. I mean, I think again because it's a we've got democratic oversight of the services and some of the savings we've got to make. I think councillors really think very, very carefully about how this any cut might impact on a family and I think again as John said in terms of music for example you know if children are, are on free school meals then you know you're, there's usually something uh, within the local authority policy that says that children who access music services and are on free, free school meals would actually you know pay, pay next to nothing or nothing at all for the for music instruction but it's not it's not that's not the, the situation across the board, but nevertheless, just using that as an example, uh, you know, I think councillors think long and hard about how they can best protect um, the most disadvantaged families within their, their their school area and make sure that these are, you know, the, 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 this, these disadvantages are, 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 are mitigated in some way to actually help with family budgets. Um, Thank you, uh, Liam MacArthur. Is a very brief supplementary. I was just on relation to the um, issue of um, sanctions we had last week about the, the proposal going forward that um, where sanctions in, in terms of maintaining um, the teacher pupil ratios have been in place um, historically um, but wouldn't be uh, for the, uh, the period we're looking at here. Now some concerns have been raised about what the, the, the practical implications are of that. Do you see any practical um, implications of that in terms of maintenance of the numbers? Yeah, I mean, obviously the sanctions has never been um, never been implemented, um, and clearly, um, unsurprisingly, Cosla has argued that there shouldn't be a sanction um, connected um, to it. So um, we'll have to see what December tells us in terms of the uh, terms of the figures. But it is a national agreement, so it isn't on a per council um, per council basis. Um, as of next year, we'll have to see what this work, um, what that. Um, um, 
what the outcome of that is. Um, if that is successful, then hopefully we're in a completely different um, situation. We're talking about outcomes rather than measuring things like teacher numbers. But the, the, you're conscious of the the risks that if, teach, if teacher numbers drop, you've actually made the argument for sanctions well, in the minds of some. It, there's also a, an argument that why would you take money away from an authority that's mm -hmm. trying to invest in, um, in in education? So there's 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 we don't think there's any argument for a, a sanction, but clearly that's part of the negotiations that we have to take place with 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 government, and you have to give and take on these things. Okay. Isn't the argument though that uh, you know. The money being taken away because you're not investing in education. That's well, the point. Well, You'd be cutting t teacher numbers, so therefore that would be that's the reason for the sanction being in place. Well, clearly it's linked to the, the agreement, as we were pointing out. There's clearly councils have to budget in the round, and there are pressures right across the, the authority. So I don't think this is a matter of authorities not investing in education. It's authorities under pressure right across what they do. Okay, thank you, George Adam. Yes, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. I'd like to ask some questions similar to what I asked last week's panel, and it's about possible solutions to budget pressures, because that's the type of guy I am. Let's try and find a solution. There's no such thing as uh, an impossible situation. So ADES is quite interesting in the fact that they say ADES has developed a range of ideals that suggest system-wide change provides a more sustainable approach. This can only be achieved through national discussion as opposed to each local authority finding its own solutions. Could, could you expand on Addis's uh, range of ideas? Yeah. Th there's two things that need to happen before we get into the detail of what the ideas might be. One is an agreement from politicians, that would be the parliament, people like yourself, COSLA, that maybe maybe we can look at the, the whole system, what we call the learner journey from you know very early years all the way through to 18 and beyond. So we, we would need that kind of sanction or that agreement first. We would then need the discussions about s specific ideas and what, what these might mean. These would have to be worked up in a way that shows two things. One, there is clearly an educational advantage and benefit and that we can improve the system. And B, that it's more efficient and, and there, there may be a, a saving, a financial saving in it. Uh, th the third element would be we'd have to ensure that no one was disadvantaged by this. So people across, and I'm not suggesting this, but people have talked about, for example, the, the age at which children start school. And there are some schools of thought that say that six would be a better time to start school education. If, if, if that were educationally proven, then you would have to ensure that families weren't disadvantaged in that process and that you had a system that could support children starting at six and you were confident that it was going to lead to improved outcomes so th that's the kind of issue that you, you would have to have a lot of agreement you would have to uh, work it through you would have to be able to consult on it you would have to involve parents you would have to involve trade unions i'm not proposing that as an idea but i think it gives you an idea of the kind of sensitivities and the potential difficulties of taking any whole system change decisions in our view we don't really have a mechanism in scotland for for having that kind of uh, decision, that kind of debate. So it's these kind of whole system issues I think we need to begin to look at. Our view is based on the fact that currently, because of the kind of decisions that are being taken, we're moving into a more diverse kind of situation, uh, whereas what we're trying to do is actually uh, improve equity and fairness. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to see uh, what the situation is like. It's linked also to issues like performance and performance frameworks and so on. So we think there are issues there we, we need to look at so that we can be much clearer about what progress is being made and whether this gap is is closing. Uh, so maybe more data, more intelligence. So there's a whole set of issues that, that, and this is just a professional view, that we need to talk about in terms of the whole system as opposed to individual cuts. Because this year you know, looks difficult, further years are going to be even more difficult. You also mentioned in your uh, submission that uh, some functions are best delivered locally, some on a more regional basis, similar to what you're saying uh, uh, there, and you council level or some across some council partnerships. Now, I bring that up because shared services has yes. been the mantra since I was a councillor, and uh, during my time yep. there was 
various starts and things stopped again, you know. Uh, some of the parents from the groups last week, uh, Scottish Parent Council Forum, uh, Eileen Pryor said, as you said in our submission, the time has come to have a radical rethink to step back and ask, is local authority delivery the best way forward for education? Now, like you, I'm not saying that's the way forward, but is this a conversation we, we should be discussing well, about how we deliver education? We are, I want to make it clear, we're specifically not saying that the political structures should change or the governance structures should change. So we're talking about operating within the current governance and political structures, and we're saying that we that there are there are areas of education that, that could be delivered in, in a different way, in, in a joint way. So if I give you, again, specific examples, and, and again, I'm not advocating this, but we looked into literacy uh, for, for the government, and there were three literacy schemes. They were based on a hub model. You had lead authorities, Fife, Councillor Chapman's own authority was one of them. Uh, Western Bartonshire was another uh, lead authority. North Lanarkshire was one, and Edinburgh was one. And uh, they they were able to they, they were able to see significant benefits in working across those authorities, particularly for psych psychologist teams. Now, currently in Scotland, uh, on the Curry report, every authority requires a principal psychologist and at least one deputy. In some cases, you get three or four deputy psychologists. We found that operating across uh, a number of authorities, there were real benefits for those psychologists because very small teams were getting access to, to different kinds of expertise uh, and it, it, it was a better way of operating. Again, I'm not suggesting that we do that, but it is you can it illustrates how there are issues where you can operate in a different way. There are a few years ago, local authorities looked at procurement and instead of doing it all individually, they, they, they worked with the Scottish Government to have a national procurement system. There may be issues like that within education where it could be done, and I'm not suggesting a centralised national body. I'm not suggesting taking education out of education authorities. I just think it's time that local government, national government, and the interested parties, including parents and unions, might be able to look at uh, the allocation of functions in a different way, which might provide efficiencies. Uh, from a causal perspective, uh, Douglas, you know, Larry Flanagan said last week the main barrier was political context, so he says it's your fault uh, that we can't get shared services over, uh, and as a former councillor, I probably I take some of the blame as well, you know, the, so how can't we manage to get uh, shared services to actually the, to work? Because there's never seems to have been anywhere where the things are, uh, some of the examples you've used, John, are good examples. But uh, there's other places I know for the fact in Clyde Valley, it fell to pieces. So why aren't we doing this? It's not rocket science. Yeah, well, um, uh, I wouldn't want to comment on Mr Flanagan's, uh, uh, some of his comments. However, the, I mean, what, what I was hoping to be able to, to say, and we sort of build on what John was saying, I mean, there, there's a lot of big things going on in Scottish education just now, and it's right from early years, curriculum for excellence is still um, developing, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we've got the Wood Commission, which is looking at the, you know, what are the, the outcomes for for young people as the, as they they progress through their education, and uh, uh, you know there's there's big activity going on in terms of uh, attainment, you know, trying to close the gap and, and literacy as well. So these are all the the, the, the sort of big things that are are, are happening. Uh, it's how, as a local authority, you can actually make that work better, and how we can. <clears throat> use all the talents of our teaching workforce to make sure that we get we get better outcomes, <clears throat> and it, m it may not be in some circumstances that the the shared service is between authority and authority. Um, it could be that in terms of a, a high school cluster, for example, you know you could actually maybe get some efficiencies within that cluster. Uh, where the outcomes for the, the children across right from early years, right through curriculum for, you know, curriculum for excellence, which is uh, goes right from 3 to, to 18 um, and into the Wood Commission and the recommendations I've got there, you know, what are the, the, the kind of um, efficiencies that can be built into the system there you know, I, I know that a lot of people have talked about uh, in terms of uh, for example, subject choice and if you've got two or three high schools that are in fairly close proximity and one is not providing I don't know um, higher German, for example, then could you make one of the high schools the, the German hub 
and so that if if we do have children who want to pursue uh, a qualification in Germany or get a higher, then the, for that that time of the day they would go to the German hub, or they could it could be done online, or there, there's other ways of actually delivering the uh, delivering that um, education to that young person and, and help and aid their learning. So. I mean, I think you're right in terms of shared services um, across local authorities. It's, it's it's not always worked as well as people would have hoped. But I think there's other ways of actually working smarter. And I think that was some of the the comments that were were made by the the parents group last week. You know how they actually work smarter, and when when things are are financially tough. And I think maybe these are some of the the, the ways we could we could do it. And I think the the teaching workforce, I I think are. Are up for that sort of challenge, and, and, and you know, I think I think these are some of the changes that could be implemented. Uh, maybe not easily, but with uh, a, a fair wind, then uh, you know, I think that's that'd be a way forward, and maybe provide you with some of the solutions uh, that you're keen to see. Thank you. Thank you. And what we're trying to do today is uh, obviously to look at the budget and to look at the impact of the budget on. Uh, education for this and future generations. Um, but I, I do have some difficulty given the Audit Scotland report and I have to uh, quote um, there has been no independent evaluation of how much councils spend on education and what this delivers in terms of improved attainment and wider achievement for pupils. So, do you know, I'm just struggling as a, a deputy convener of the Audit Committee but also with the Education Committee hat on. And if we look at the same report, uh, there is, uh, Auditor General again, there is no consistent approach to tracking and monitoring the progress of pupils from P1 to S3. So I hear what uh, Cosler are saying. In fact, I think you say that you've come to an agreement with the Scottish Government uh, from next year you've reached a new agreement where you should begin shifting the focus away from input measures such as te uh, teacher numbers to more useful uh, measures of education outcomes. Obviously, uh, I very much welcome that because I do think it's a bit like the NHS, more doctors and nurses, you know, does that mean we're all healthier? But uh, I I'm actually struggling to find out, you know, Where are the outcomes? According to the Auditor General, there is no relationship defined between how much is spent on education, where it's spent, whether that's more teachers, less teachers, more quality improvement, more staff development, more primary teachers. We just don't seem to have the information about where is the best place to spend the money in order to achieve a better outcome. I can't find that. And the Auditor General says that you don't have that. So can you can you help me? Hi, and I think because I think it ties into what John was talking about um, um, earlier. Clearly the link between spend and attainment um, in what you put into a service, you get something out of it. But I think it's not right to say that if you spend X amount, that gives you a return in terms of outcomes. So the, the idea that you just magically alight in a figure and that gives you everything you want that's not that's not true clearly there is there's a far more complicated picture than um picture than that and to some extent that's the work that we want to undertake and we're not necessarily saying it's, it's easy it's not but that's what we want to undertake the information I and mean, if you look at what currently you can get information on it does tend to be round about things that you can more easily measure, which tends to be things like qualification levels and things that tend to be more in senior phase. So, you know, that's part of the part of the issue. Um, I mean, you know, John was effectively talking about work about how you better understand the impact that certain things might have. Um, so if you invest in them, are they really going to deliver a result or not? So I think that's what he was saying um, see, saying there. But, the, but there is a gap in terms of between, you know, um, uh, broad general education, primary and early secondary, um, in terms of just the information that you could gather from that. But that's, that's you know, to some extent a, a challenge we, we recognise, whether we can... I don't think we're going to be solving that in five months, but I think what we're trying to do is make a good start on that so that then we can build upon that in subsequently years. 
and uh, there's obviously more focus on uh, Scottish education in the past 16 years. So can you understand that it's a wee bit of a shock that uh, the Auditor General says that uh, we don't know the relationship between spending and outcomes? And can I just say, uh, decisions have been made. This is uh, Directors of Education. Um, the level of support... Support assistance, breakfast clubs, study support, auxiliaries, after-school care, sports culture, leisure clubs may well be reduced. Uh, many already have been reduced. Uh, some will also review vocational options, course offerings and links with college. We're talking about the Wood Commission. And then the removal of management, development, quality improvement and support posts from central staffing and all authorities has reduced schools capacity to respond to curriculum development and agency working. So the point I'm making is that all of this uh, page three on the uh, briefing paper from the directors of education, all of these aspects or uh, all of this spending in education has been reduced and also, given that we're seeing an increase in children going to primary school, in the past four years, primary school teachers have been reduced by 12%. So all of this has been reduced, but we don't know if that is going to affect attainment or achievement for school pupils in general. So you're saying that you don't really know the link between spending and outcomes, but there's been a pretty good fist at cutbacks here. So how do I know as a member of this committee that you're cutting back in the right places and that this is going to lead to better outcomes? The important point to remember is there's local scrutiny over, over budgets. Yeah. So the decisions that are taken locally, as, as uh, Councillor Chapman was saying, clearly they have to weigh up the impact that certain things were having. What I was sort of... What I was... Don't have then? Do they know what works and what's what's better and what isn't? Well, see, uh, John might be able to talk about a little bit more. Clearly, there are there is information that councils have about service planning, about what uh, you know, um, what happens within schools. There are there are there is more information locally than than, and and. But you can't necessarily aggregate that up in a comparable way to, to develop a national uh, a national picture. So that's what we're saying. So, but just to use raw figures like per spend per pupil, that doesn't necessarily tell you much about whether that's a good service or not. There's a much more um, nuanced picture, and that's the role of local education authorities in terms of their scrutiny and role of their, of their, of their responsibilities. Yeah, I think I've that as well. I think that, um Locally, you know, there's there's a lot of information that goes to uh, councillors in terms of uh, uh, educational performance in individual schools um, that you'll no doubt be aware of as well. But um, uh, and certainly from our local authority in Fife, you know, we we do interview our our, our local head teachers and have them in to 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 be scrutinised on on their individual school performance um, and. You know, I think the level of uh, professionalism as well that we have within local authorities uh, from a central point of view uh, in terms of quality control and, and uh, making sure that, that schools are supported uh, even though we're, we're facing some fairly um, serious serious cuts. Um, the, you know, that, that the level of support that's, that's already there and expertise means that we can actually focus on the things that do work uh, in schools and make sure that our staff are, are in, a, in a, a, a best position to try and deliver the services, even in the background, even with the background of having, uh, you know, s some severe financial pressures. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have to move on. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. I, I was going to ask about whether or not we've got the, the balance between national and local decision making right, but I think John probably answered that in response to, to George Adams' questions. Um, but I think in the same session uh, with last week's witnesses, um, there was some discussion about uh, the effect of postcode lotteries, uh, which I suppose are the, the flip side of, of locally based prioritisation. Um, but there was also an, an argument um, that the, there was perhaps a need for more national parameters. So if not ring fencing, at least national parameters. I think Larry Flanagan was talking about a national staffing standard. Now, I know, Councillor Chapman, you weren't going to be lured into commenting on EIS's uh, remarks last week. But in relation to that, uh, uh, have you any observations about how that might be made to, um, to work at a local level? 
I mean, there are already um, guidelines set down in terms of class sizes uh, across all primary stages and and into into secondary, and that's often the the the, the, the trigger for establishing what the the staffing levels might be within within a school. Um, you know, I, I think we maybe need to hear more detail about what's in in, in Larry's head. But I mean, um, you know. As far as we're concerned, you know, I think we're content with the the, the, the current system, um, and whether there's there's the relationship, there needs to be a change in the relationship. You know, I think that's something that that we need to discuss with with uh, with the Scottish government. Um, you know, uh, at, at the moment, uh, you know, we've got a very definite role in terms of of, of delivery uh, and making sure that if there are um, national uh, ambitions or, or standards to be met, then that's a part of the negotiation that we have with with Scottish government, and we do that on almost a a day and daily basis uh, to make sure that local authorities are delivering what's expected of them, and that if we have any concerns with the direction of travel in terms of education policy, then we've got a pretty good line into um, the decision makers within within the government to say that. You know, maybe maybe we should rethink X or rethink Y, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, we, 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 it's a negotiated uh, settlement, and that's that's the way we've, we've worked, and uh, it seems to work quite well. Take you back to a point you made earlier about the example you used in, in relation to supply teachers and and drawing on that pool across local authority boundaries, which um, uh, on the face of it seems to make sense. Difficult for your constituents. Uh, well, I, in, <laughs> indeed, indeed, um, I, I, the, the Orkney being the exception to to the rule is is not something I'm unfamiliar with in the committee. Um, in in I suppose in, in compensation for something that may draw supply teachers across a wider area, is there scope for looking at arrangements that would allow um, the duration of that supply to be um, uh, over a longer period and, and provide them a degree more certainty uh, and continuity, both for for the staff but also for the for the the, the, the pupils as well? Is that a, a quid pro quo you would see being kind of necessary as part of that arrangement? Yeah. That's good. I want to bring another member in before we have to right. close. That's fine. Yeah, and, um, I, I think again that the, the I mean, uh, a lot of people who are involved in uh, teachers who are involved in supply um, maybe don't do it as a, a, a see it as a, a full time career. Uh, you know, they, they they do it because maybe got to fit round either caring for children or caring for for elderly relatives and so on. So it's not always a it's not always a, as easy as you know you would suggest, but. Day there is is fine. Maybe what they're looking for, but mm -hmm. if a day here and a day there is spread over a, a larger area, yeah. um, you can see how that may pose yeah. problems. Uh -huh. But I, I mean, I think going back to the previous point, I think we'll, we we are working on a, a, a range of recommendations. So we may, obviously we need to sort of take that into account when we're, we're coming to conclusions on that. But we'll, I'll, I'll certainly take that back to our, our next meeting as well. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and very briefly, <coughs> Claire Adamson. Um, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I'd like to ask um, uh, something that has been touched on in the evidence about the National Performance Framework. And um, Is there any evidence to demonstrate that National Performance Framework has helped improve outcomes at the moment? And how does it inform the spending allocations of both the government and local authorities? Can I say that National Performance Framework, I think, has certainly encouraged authorities to look much more in a much more focused way at what you're actually producing as a result of the investment in education. Uh, I have to re respond to some of the points that Mary Scanlon raised because the auditor's report did say that there has been improvement over, over 10 years and part of that is because people are focusing on what, what makes a difference. There's obviously a lot of research on what makes a difference in education and the government actually produced uh, some documentation for authorities in terms of these are the basic things that improve education systems. So that's what authorities improve on. Half of the re half of the recommendations in the auditor's report are about better better benchmarking, better performance information, and that's at the level, the operational level. Although the report says there's no consistent framework, individual authorities have a consistent framework. Uh, what it's saying is that there's no agreed shared across Scotland. And I think it's very important to distinguish between high-level outcomes at the top end, where you as politicians want to know things are improving and the investment in education is having success, and the detailed operational day-to-day -day progress tracking 
of teachers, and that's where they become nervous if their individual kind of tracking becomes part of a, a kind of a public accountability issue. Their accountability is directly to parents. Parents want, if parents want to find out how their bairn's doing, they go to the school, they speak to the teacher. That that is proper accountability as long as that's benchmarked and checked and so on. So somehow we have to work out a system that meets all of these these requirements. The requirements of parents, the sensitivities of teachers the high-level performance measures that you will require as a parliament. Please join me in 10 minutes' time in the garden lobby, where all building users will be invited to observe two minutes' silence of remembrance for all those who have suffered and died in the service of their country and all those who mourn them. There will be a further announcement to indicate the start of the period of silence. That's why I was trying to hurry up there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Claire, do you have a very brief supplementary? Oh, it was uh, um, Douglas earlier on. You, you mentioned about moving towards more outcome focus in, in what um, Causal is moving forward with in this. But um, Larry Flanagan was quite sceptical last week in his evidence about that, um, um, saying that the outcome agreements may be so nebulous they may not mean anything. Could you maybe? Comment on that. Uh, uh, yeah, I think very briefly. I, th I think at a national level, they need, they need to be that that high level, and they can. I, I seem to be a bit of a, a blunt instrument in a way. I think the, the, the real value, I think, is looking be below that, and some of the work the local authorities carry out, and head teachers carry out with their staff in, in schools. And I think that's where the uh, our focus is, and where the, the focus should be in terms of you know that relationship between the pupil, the, the parent, and the school uh, to make sure that we're actually delivering the kind of outcomes that we need to grow and develop our economy and that's that's really what it's all about as well you know how do we make our economy stronger by having a well-educated workforce or ch children leaving school to be become part of that workforce okay, much obviously we've been slightly curtailed for good reason um, this morning so uh, can i thank you for your evidence it was very useful in a number of areas we will follow that up with the scottish government the cabinet secretary and the minister on the next panel uh, we will um, reconvene at 11.15, but before I suspend, can I just say that it is my intention to write to you to follow up on a number of areas and some of the areas we didn't get a chance to, to reach this morning because of, because of the slightly curtailed uh, time for the panel this morning. So, but, for that, but hopefully you'll be able to respond to us quite quickly, obviously, so that we can include your answers in our report. Thank you very much, uh, and I'll suspend so that we can allow members to go to the garden lobby. Thank you.
Uh, can I welcome our second, second panel of witnesses this morning? We have Michael Russell, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, Derek Mackay, Minister for Local Government and Planning, Fiona Robertson, Director of Learning, and Bill Stitt, Local Government Finance Team, Scottish Government. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance today. Uh, I understand both the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary would like to provide short opening statements. Is that correct? OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, are you going to begin? Thank you, Convener. And in a moment, uh, Derek Mackay will set out the broader context of the budget. But first, I'm going to speak about the progress we are making and some of the decisions that we now face if we're to meet our ambitions for Scottish education. Uh, since 2007, we've seen constant improvement in our education system, supported by appropriate change. When this government first came to power, Curriculum for Excellence was running aground, standards were slipping, our PISA scores were drifting, and a high proportion of our school buildings were in poor condition. We've turned this around. Uh, CFE has now been rolled out as a way we do education and is producing ever better outcomes. We've record exam results and a record high number of school leavers in positive destinations. We've halted our decline in the PISA tables. We've reinforced our international standing in education. And we've more new or refurbished schools. 463 school building projects have been completed since this government came to bar 135 more than the preceding administration. And there's other progress too, convener, on early years, on free school meals, on attainment, on vocational education. So across all the main measures, across the whole area of education, what exists now is better than what existed in 2007. That's the reality. But we cannot rest on our laurels. Indeed, we shouldn't. We should do more. We should work across the political divide with the unions, with parents, with pupils, with local authorities. That's how we achieve the best results for Scotland. I made that case to this committee convener in April. I make it again now. Of course, with the powers of independence, the powers of a normal state, we could have used tax, welfare and labour market regulation to bear down on the real enemy of educational progress, which is poverty. In the event, Scotland didn't vote yes. But there are consequences to that decision for this and for future budgets. We have now to find a way of getting better results with the money that we have. And the first thing we should do, convener, is to be true to the tradition of Scottish education whilst always seeking to improve outcomes. We won't do that by chasing the latest fad. We won't do it by misrepresenting the actual improving reality of Scottish education. We won't do it by imitating what is failing elsewhere. The Finnish educator, Pazi Solberg, now teaching at Harvard, and whose students are studying for the master's degree in international education and looking with approval at what Scotland is doing now, describes much of what is taking place in other countries as being infected by GERM, the Global Education Reform Movement. Now, I'd be happy to explain the perils of GERM at greater length later if I'm asked, but I do want to reinforce the real key points of GERM because we're trying to improve Scottish education by utilising those points. Successful, well-rooted educational systems which are not part of GERM have high confidence in teachers and principals as professionals, Encourage teachers and students to try new ideas and approaches, in other words, to put curiosity, imagination and creativity at the heart of learning, and see that the purpose of teaching and learning is to cultivate development of the whole child. Now, I want Scotland to remain germ-free, and that's what I think the vast majority of Scottish parents and teachers want too. I want a system that has high confidence in teachers, it's open, creative, and which is Scotland as the best place to grow up. That approach encourages innovation. That's why, for example, the week after the referendum, I announced we'd convene a Children and Young Persons Summit. That's what we are doing. And I was bowled over at the first planning meeting yesterday by the ideas and aspirations of Scotland's young people. Instead of being fixated with structures, our approach is focused on improving and closing the attainment gap, as well as creating greater equity. It's an outcome-based approach with local authorities, and that's the best guarantor of educational stability and progress. We should be placing teachers, young people, teaching and teachers at the heart of improving outcomes for our children and young people. So let me make it absolutely clear to the committee. I don't believe you can drive up attainment and improve outcomes with fewer teachers. We're, of course, committed to working with local government and with the engagement of parents and trade unions in seeking to reach an agreement on better educational outcomes and what these might be. Those discussions have commenced. They're not concluded. But teachers are at the heart of achieving the very best outcomes for our children and young people and a top priority for government. So, convener, the progress we are making in Scottish education, the hard work we've put into Curriculum for Excellence, the inspiration we're drawing from the improvement partnerships, the emphasis we want to place on developing Scotland's young workforce, all those things now need to be taken forward in a time of ever greater financial insecurity. 
The time is, of course, right for a detailed reflection by all the players in Scottish education about what should come next and how Scotland can continue to improve. We must press on with the progress we've made, but we will do that by building on the strong Scottish approach to innovation, as well as our proud history as the oldest system of compulsory schooling in the world. I'm very open to discussions, Sabina, about how we do that, and I look forward to that discussion. Thank you. Uh, Dan McKay. Uh, thank you, Convener. The Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning has clearly outlined how the Scottish Government has created the forward-looking policies for our local government partners to take forward and implement, but clearly they also need to have the adequate resources to fulfil these ambitions. The vast majority of the funding for primary and secondary school spending is provided as part of the annual local government finance settlement, and as the committee will know, the government has worked very hard with COSLA to provide as fair settlements as has been possible, given the cuts imposed on the Scottish budget by the UK government. Given that the Scottish budget is roughly decided, divided into three, with health and local government sharing around two-thirds, and everything else having to be funded from the remaining third, and the health budget having received a real terms increase in each and every year as set out in our manifesto, this meant some very difficult decisions have had to be taken to maintain the local government budget. Despite these pressures, local government has been treated very fairly under this government, with the local government finance settlements being maintained across the period 2012 to 16 on a like with like basis with extra money for new duties. This has resulted in a total settlement of over £10.6 billion pounds in 2014-15, and this is set to increase to almost £10.8 billion in 15-16. We do as a government, however, expect something in return for maintaining our funding in the face of this difficult financial situation, and have worked with COSLA to ensure that all 32 local authorities have frozen their council tax since 2008-9, and as the Cabinet Secretary made clear in his opening statement, we're working with COSLA to reach an agreement on what educational outcomes may look like. Local authorities do, of course, supplement their central government funding with their locally raised council tax income, and again the Scottish Government has fully funded the council tax freeze by providing an additional baseline sum, uh, baseline sum of a £78 million for each year from 2008-9 for each of the seven years of the freeze to date, with a further £70 million being provided for 15-16. The committee will be well aware that there are no actual allocations of funding for specific services, with the vast majority of the funding, including funding in support of primary and secondary school education, being provided by means of block grant. This government does not believe in micromanaging how local authorities spend their money. It is the responsibility of individual local authorities to manage their own budgets and to allocate the total financial resources available to them on the basis of local needs and priorities, having first fulfilled their statutory obligations and the jointly agreed set of national and local priorities. We know, however, that local authorities are budgeting to spend £4.6 billion this year on education, which represents 40% of their total net revenue expenditure. I would, of course, be happy to answer any question committee members may have about local government funding settlement and allocations. Thank you both very much. Um, we're just going straight to questions now. And can I begin uh, by asking Jane Baxter to start us off? Yeah. Morning. Um, my question is pretty straightforward. It's... Um, do you expect there will be significant cuts to local authority school budgets in 2015-16? No, I, I hope that won't be the case. The Scottish Government funding to local government is set to increase from £10.6 billion this year to £10.8 billion in 2015-16. Uh, it is for local authorities to decide how to spend the resources allocated to them. As, as, as the Minister has indicated, uh, ring fencing has virtually disappeared. But no, I, I see no reason for that. However... I do think there is a strong argument for imagining and putting in place better ways of delivering. And, for example, I know you've been talking uh, with various witnesses about shared services and issues of that nature. I think that local authorities could, could become ever more effective in delivering by taking uh, those routes. In addition, um, it's the case that some of the uh, new funding that's been announced um, arising from political priorities such as uh, expansion in childcare and free school meals. These are dedicated specific resources for those purposes, negotiated, of course, with uh, local government. So each council will embark, they are at the moment, on various consultation exercises as to how they manage their budgets. Of course, not everything they're consulting upon 
may actually come to fruition in the budget. She'll be aware of the cycle. There's consultation, final figures are approved uh, by this parliament, then councils will set their budgets. So they'll look at a range of options, but we've no reason to believe that the, the, the nature of cuts that you suggest it would be impacted uh, on local schools. It has been um, the aspiration of councils to, to meet their uh, obligations and commit to the, um, uh, the new obligations that, that the parliaments uh, agreed and have negotiated with local authorities and balance the books. But the member will be well aware it's been in quite difficult circumstances with financial pressures and cost pressures. But the way that we've been able to protect uh, local government has been significant. Quite a different picture south of the border, I have to say, where they've had the worst of all worlds of reducing budgets, compulsory redundancies, council tax rises, the worst of all worlds, which isn't the case in Scotland. That said, of course, there are significant pressures that I'm sure we'll explore as the day goes on. Okay, thanks. Um, well, that being said, um, how, therefore, do you explain the perception and the, the submissions given to us by ADES, teachers' unions and parents' groups that there will be cuts? We heard that last week and we heard it again this morning. They believe that there will be cuts. We're in a position here which does not deny the challenging economic position, but also makes it clear that the decisions that local authorities have to make are for local authorities to make within a budget settlement which is as generous as we can make it. Uh, you know, my colleague Mr Swinney and Mr Mackay work constantly with local authorities in that regard. Nobody could deny, of course, the pressure from Westminster on Scottish government budgets and the austerity measures that we have had and allegedly are still to come. If you read uh, today's press, you will see that the Treasury has apparently been asked for £30 billion worth of further cuts. We're not immune from that, of course. But I do think the approach that we have taken, which is very deliberate, first of all, to remove at the request of the local authorities ring fencing to the, the, the massively greater part, to allow local authorities to make their own decisions, to ensure that the priorities, the educational priorities, are clear, but allow them, which is the Scottish model, allow them to interpret how they deliver those educational priorities in their own way, has been the right way forward. Now, I do think there is more that local authorities can do to, as I say, reimagine the delivery of education and to work uh, you know, across boundaries to make sure that the education is delivered as effectively and uh, uh, efficiently as possible. And that's what I would encourage them to do. Jane Baxter will be well aware that uh, education is a very large part of a local authority's budget. Uh, approximately, if you were to take an average, around 40% of um, total budgeted net revenue expenditure by local government uh, is on education. So I think you have to put the, the overall financial picture in context, and that's in large measure due to uh, staffing costs, um, of course. And if there were to be no reductions at all in education, you can imagine the impact it would have on other services as well. So you have to look at everything in the round. And very mindful, as I'm sure all members are, on the Audit Scotland report, the Accounts Commission, um, that looks at deprivation as well in a factor, as a factor in education. So we have to consider all services as they affect our young people uh, as they go forward. But as I say, there's a range of consultations. Not everything a council consults upon uh, may come to fruition. That will be a matter for them. And as they consult and engage, make the priorities that reflect uh, the demands of local communities. And we'd expect that consultation to involve... Uh, parents, pupils and, and staff as well. Thank you. Thanks. Neil. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, good morning Minister. Um, Cabinet Secretary, last time you were at the committee, um, you said that you would like to maintain teachers' numbers and, if possible, increase them. Do you still stand by that comment? Yes. OK. Is it, can we take that, that as a commitment that teacher numbers will be maintained in the coming year? Well, I, I don't employ a single teacher, as you know, Mr Bibby. Those are employed by local authorities. You're also aware that the local authorities, uh, led by a Labour councillor, uh, Councillor O'Neill, have requested that the Scottish Government sit down with them, uh, and I quote the, the letter uh, of agreement on this matter, that we sit down with them and discuss outcomes in education because they have raised issues of teacher employment. Now, the agreement that we've come to to have those discussions has a number of, of elements. 
right? We have a present commitment to maintain teacher numbers in line with pupil numbers. And you heard this morning uh, the commitment from Councillor Chapman that he thought that that would be met in the current year. And I I'm glad to hear that commitment because it's for local authorities to meet it. Going forward, it, local authorities want to discuss whether that is simply one element within the mix and whether there are other things that they need to do. I've made it clear to local authorities that I'm willing to have conversations, but they can't be without the involvement of teachers' unions, without parents, and without others. I've also made it clear that if new, no new agreement was reached, then there would be a continued commitment exactly as it is now to maintain those teacher numbers in line with pupil numbers. I've also said in my statement this morning, I don't believe you can increase outcomes by reducing teacher numbers. So that's where I stand, uh, and that's where I will continue to stand. And indeed, I think that's where most reasonable people would stand. In terms of, so you're, you're obviously taking part in those negotiations wanting to maintain teacher numbers. Previously, you said, you, if possible, you wanted to increase them. Mm. Will you provide local authorities additional resource well, for more teachers? We already provide resource for local authorities to maintain teacher numbers, £41 million pounds in addition to the normal settlement. We already provide a resource which is underspent, but we don't claw it back. On probationers, we provide £37.5 million pounds for probationers, of which councils presently spend around £21 million. Pounds. So those resources are there. Now, you know, Mr. Bibby, I would love to have lots more money available for education. That would require a different financial settlement from the one that we're in. But my policy intention would be to maintain teacher numbers. I think it's important. I think you should raise this issue with some others. I think you could start raising it with councillors Matheson and McCabe, a leader of Glasgow and North Lanarkshire, who are responsible, those councils responsible for a quarter of the reduction in teacher numbers since 2007. I think you should also reflect that since I put in place the agreement with COSLA uh, in terms of uh, teacher numbers matching pupil numbers, then we've had a very small reduction uh, indeed. Uh, so I am as good as my word in this. I would like to do more. I hope local authorities would also share my ambition. And perhaps you could persuade your Labour Party colleagues to share that ambition. Well, it's quite interesting when I'm raising issues about education in Scotland that the Education Secretary turns around and says, raise it with somebody else. Oh, no, I, I no, 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 I don't say that. Uh, and if you do not understand how Scottish education works, Mr Bibby, I'm happy to tell you. The delivery of education is done by local authorities. That's what you're inquiring into. I would have thought you would have realised that. In those circumstances, there are a number of players now, I am not the sole player in Scottish education. I would not contend that. There are a number of players, and local authorities are a key player. There is indeed a tripartite structure in place in Scotland that involves trade unions, uh, the local authorities, and the Scottish government. They all have to be part of the process. Now, I'm suggesting to you that those parts of the process that you could also influence, which are the Labour authorities which have cut teacher numbers, you should go and influence. Cabinet Secretary, I started my question by reminding you of your comments last time you were at the Education mm -hmm. Committee where you said, if possible, mm -hmm. you wanted to increase teacher numbers. I'm mm -hmm. asking you, will you provide additional resource for extra teachers? If possible, I would provide additional resource. Mr Bibby, you also support a system that is borne down on the Scottish Government's resource. So you should take some responsibility. You, you should take some responsibility yourself for the financial pressures that exist in Scotland. You campaigned recently for a system that drives down the Scottish budget. And you, you can shift in your seat all you want, Mr well, Bibby. That's the reality. Now, if you are prepared to work with, across party lines, to work with me and to work with local authorities to secure, first of all, the existing teacher number commitment, and secondly, to see a desirable increase in teacher numbers, I'm with you on that. But understand there are many players in that, and that includes those people who have driven down the Scottish budget. Well, I'm, we're not here to rerun the independence referendum, but if you've seen the, the, the price of uh, oil, which you were calculating um, uh, all the resources of an independent Scotland go, um, go down recently... You're still a friend of a system that's driving down the Scottish right, budget. Not, you can't avoid it, Mr Bibby. I'm going to interrupt because... We're, we're not here uh, to talk I'm about I'm going to interrupt both of you, actually, because... I don't want to rerun the independence referendum right. today. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of opportunities to discuss that subject with this committee, but let's stick to the budget um, and education, if you don't mind. You said, if possible, you would like to increase teacher numbers. Are you now saying 
it's impossible? No, to uh, it is perfectly possible to do so, providing the resources are provided. You know, but recognise the realities of finance, Mr Bibby. Recognise the realities of austerity which you have supported. Recognise the roles of Scottish local authorities, in particular Labour authorities, that have continued to drive down teacher numbers. And let's try, and I made it clear in my opening statement, let's try and work together on this. The presentation of those figures that you have given has been partial and it has been largely inaccurate. I am trying to get the best deal possible because I regard teachers, as I've indicated, as exceptionally important to delivering education. But you won't provide local authorities well, with more money for well, more teachers. Mr Bibby, when that money is talk, made talk. available in a suitable financial settlement, I'll be delighted to provide it. Why don't you argue for that best type of settlement instead of being an enemy of that type of settlement? Why, why don't you argue for that within the, the Scottish Government? We've heard um, concerns from teacher unions about a workload crisis in teach um, amongst teachers, um, possibilities of changing the length of the school day. We've heard about a lack of teaching supply. We've even heard concerns about the real possibility uh, as a result of budget cuts and a lack of teaching supply that children could be sent home. That's the EIS. That could be sent home as a result of a lack of teaching supply. Can, well, you, ask, can, you give a, can you give a guarantee that that will not happen? We've had concerns that that ask, might happen I mean, I would, later this year. I would be delighted if you asked Councillor Matheson why he has reduced teaching numbers in Glasgow while pupil numbers are rising, because that's an element. Now, what I want to do is to have a, an agreement across the, the Scottish education that provides the best possible situation in terms of teacher numbers and outcomes, and that's what I'm trying to achieve. But you've got to remember in, in all these matters that this is a, a resource issue, and resource issues are being borne down on by the Westminster government. So my colleague, Mr Mackay, here is having to manage, along with Mr Swinney, a budget that's under endless pressure from Westminster. Now, if you're prepared to stand up and argue for more money that can go into education because we've got a larger budget, well and good. If you're prepared to argue areas of the Scottish budget that should not be spent to put money, more money into education, your uh, co colleague, whoever that is on the finance side, will be arguing that presently with Mr Swinney, and I hope they bring forward those ideas. Then, by all means put those things in place. But what we've actually got on workload is substantial progress over the last year. Because instead of talking about it, you know, in the empty way that I've heard from you and your colleagues, I set up a workload group with the agreement of the EIS on which the unions were all represented. We produced a major document which has been distributed to every school. And the unions themselves accept that this is the first significant step forward in workload that they have ever had. Now, I'll go on doing that. My colleague Alistair Allen convenes that group. Uh, they met recently and, and came to agreement about further actions that they needed to take to drive forward the issue of workload. So we're taking significant action to assist Scottish teachers with their workload. I would suggest, if you've not already done so, you look at the evidence from the teaching unions and parents' organisations around the issue of workload, if you think the issue of workload has been addressed, and I don't think you're in touch with what's happening I meet the in teaching unions every few months. I'm meeting EIS again this week. We always talk about workload. We always reflect on the progress that has been made. The Reflections Report on CFE dealt with workload. We are making substantial progress. The unions say we are making substantial progress. Final question, um, Local authorities are under pressure. Education services are under pressure. You mentioned um, about local authorities perhaps sharing services. Are, are, are there any suggestions where local authorities should be making savings in terms of education that they've not already, that you would suggest? I am very keen to see innovation from local authorities in terms of how they deliver. Now, Stirling and Clackmannan have uh, a, a joint education department, and that obviously spreads the... Um, load in terms of what the expenditure takes place. Regrettably, that's the only one. I saw the questioning this morning where you raised, uh, I think Mr Adam raised the issue of, of shared services across local authorities, and that has not gone forward in the way it might do. So that's one area. But there are some other interesting innovations that are taking place in education. Actually, Scottish education is full of innovation. You'd have seen <coughs> at the weekend an account of the virtual Alan Glens that's being set up to look at science education in Glasgow. I think that's useful. Uh, you'd have seen the work of Glasgow, well, maybe you didn't see it, but you'd have seen the work of Glasgow Caledonian University in encouraging a coming together on the issue of advanced hires. There are a lot of ways in which people can share and pool resources, not just to take away, uh, to share the cost burden, but actually sometimes to get something 
that's greater than the sum of its part. I would commend the Glasgow Caledonian Initiative as being fascinating in terms of the highest possible educational outcomes for people studying advanced higher. So there's lots of possibilities. I would encourage an imaginative approach to delivering education in Scotland, and I will be a friend of that where it takes place. Certainly there is, I think, uh, much room for improvement on the agenda of shared services, but it's not something that Scottish Government can compel local authorities to do. We can ensure that any barriers to shared services and collaboration and cooperation are removed and that the conditions are there for further uh, shared services, not just in education, but across the broad range of council services. In fact, if savings were realised in other departments, then maybe local authorities could choose to redirect savings to the education budget if they so chose. And there has been some progress in some shared services uh, in terms of out with education roads or waste, for example, and some within education. But I think local authorities do have to look more imaginatively at the shared services agenda. And it was some years ago in Mr Bibby's own area in the west of Scotland that it was the Clyde Valley collaboration where I think it was eight local authorities worked together. Huge spending power, huge capacity for shared services that were identified, but very few work streams went forward. That wasn't the actions of Scottish Government or anyone else for that matter. It was a decision of those leaders to determine what goes forward and what doesn't. There are no barriers to shared services. Audit agencies have said the same. Governments <coughs> provided the conditions to progress with that. And I think we could realise further savings in local authorities and other public services if there was greater shared services. And that's partly where community planning comes into play, by aligning resources, by working together, by maximising the spend of the public sector at a partnership level, then I think we can do more with the same resource. And that's the challenge uh, with the existing uh, resources that we face in the Westminster-based uh, budget uh, reductions. So I think that uh, parents, groups and others are right to identify shared services as one potential way forward, but there is nothing stopping local authorities merging management structures, focusing on procurement and best practice and, and getting on with that. We've provided a large measure of budget prote protection that other parts of the Scottish Government's expenditure have faced. Uh, and I think that it is an imperative that local authorities uh, support this agenda in the way that maybe some opportunities have been missed in the past. But it is a matter for them. If we start to compel, you can guarantee it won't work. It has to be organic from the local authorities to choose what works best in their local areas. Okay, thank you very much. A uh, brief supplementary, I think, from Liam MacArthur. Not all that brief. Well, I'd prefer <laughs> if it was brief. <laughs> well, I mean, we've started with opening statements. Uh, good morning, first of all, um, which suggest, I think rather patronisingly, that in 2007 we reached a year zero where education was going to hell in a handcart. Uh, we were then treated to the usual narrative that it's all Westminster's fault, uh, to which we've added councillors uh, Matheson, McCabe, uh, and even Neil Bid Bibby to the uh, list of, of, of culprits. But Addis have made clear that, in their evidence, um, new burdens have been placed on councils. Now, the, the welcome um, advances being put forward in relation to childcare provision, there's no doubt, have created new burdens. Now, there's been the financial memorandum surrounding those extra childcare provision uh, was absolutely hammered by the Finance Committee. Um, the issue around some of the uh, capital uh, provision within that, I think, were called into serious question. So would you suggest that uh, the government in this respect has placed additional pressures on, on local government? Uh, or do you think that that too was perhaps the fault of Westminster, Councillor Matheson, McCabe or Neil Bibby? I'll certainly take this point up in terms of negotiation. When the government or the parliament uh, commits to a policy that has a burden on local authorities, we negotiate with those local authorities through their umbrella organisation, COSLA, to arrive at the global sum and then distribution as to how that that's shared with the individual local authorities on whatever basis is deemed appropriate. But surely it wouldn't surprise Mr MacArthur to know that sometimes local authority will produce different figures to Scottish Government because we're in a process of negotiation and sometimes those cycles are at a different stage and we have different methodology, we'll have a different approach and some of it may well be each side trying to ensure that their interests are protected. But what matters is you 
reach a resolution and you deliver the policy and in areas such as free school meals or childcare or whatever it happens to be, we reach that resolution in partnership with local government. Crucially, we agree it and then we agree the distribution methodology as to how it's shared across the country to achieve the purpose. Now, in any negotiation, there'll be a difference. People will pitch for the best they can get naturally and that might sometimes lead to some friction. But I can say that the style of our negotiations is night and day from what local government enjoyed from any previous administration and it's in that spirit of partnership following on from the Concordat that's ensured that we have settled at a figure that will ensure that these policies are fully funded. They are new burdens and they will come with new resources to ensure that they're delivered on the ground. Uh and just now, listening to that, it, I'm reminded of the words of uh, the former uh, Nottingham Forest and Derby manager, Brian Clough, where we had uh, we all discussed it through and then we agreed that I was right. But the other issue that Larry Flanagan raised last week um, was in relation to where the, the, the government's priorities are. Now, that's uh, for any government to determine. The, the, the Scottish government has placed a priority on a council tax freeze. And as Larry Flanagan was pointing out last week, that places additional pressure uh, on local authorities. It also uh, uh, reduces by a considerable amount, the amount that Scottish Government has uh, to fund, whether in education, health or, or any other uh, area. So, in a sense, that's not the fault of West Westminster, that's not the fault of Councillor Mathis and McCabe or indeed Neil Bibby, but that is a pressure that the Scottish Government has adopted through its own political priorities and then, in consequence, has a bearing on, on where you have money to spend and not to spend. Mr MacArthur's right, it's a policy choice uh, with a mandate, of course, from the Scottish electorate to deliver it. I think put the £70 million pounds compensation into perspective of a budget, a grant of over £10.8 billion pounds to local authorities. So put that £70 million pounds into perspective. Of course, if a local authority chooses not to, they don't have to freeze the council tax, but they won't get the compensation so to do. And I think that's significant. And of course, some of those local authorities would have proposed not to increase the council tax for good reason anyway, to try and protect hard-pressed Households, but the overall budget settlement that's given to local authorities, I'm convinced, has protected frontline services from the worst ravages of Westminster reductions. And you can see that difference south of the border. I simply make that comparison for information that south of the border there's compulsory re uh, redundancies, reductions in service, and a council tax increase and removal of some of the reductions that have helped the most vulnerable. And that takes us back to the deprivation point again, that it is important to have quality school buildings and quality education, but if children are brought up, brought up in a cycle of deprivation, it certainly doesn't help with educational achievement uh, and attainment. And in terms of those policy choices, we've obviously protected health, as we stated we would do in the manifesto, and then next we've protected local authority budgets. And I say again that the local authority budget will grow in cash terms, yes, with new burdens, but largely relating to education. I'm not denying there's cost pressures. Of course there are, and of course there are consequences. But I think the government has to get, will take responsibility, but some credit for making the kind of decisions that ensure that more pupils are in good quality buildings and with protected frontline services in very, very difficult circumstances. You've mentioned the point about sanctions in relation to local council tax uh, freeze. Um, the sanctions that were also in place um, in terms of holding to teacher pupil numbers have been lifted. If the, the logic behind lifting them in relation to the, the latter is sound, uh, would you see envisaged circumstances where lifting the, the sanctions in relation to the council tax fees in due course? They haven't been lifted. They've been suspended while we have the discussion about... Well, it's an important difference. I mean, you know, it's not a semantic difference to see the difference between the definition of lifted and suspended. It's quite clear. The, they have been suspended while we have the discussion over outcomes. Uh, the letter of agreement makes it quite clear that if there's no agreement on outcomes, then the sanctions will continue. So they haven't been lifted. They're not going to be operated while we have this discussion. But they apply to this year. And, of course, we have been uh, quite prepared to be generous and flexible in these matters because we have worked in partnership with local authority to preserve teacher numbers. And we have succeeded in doing so in the last three years after a very difficult period up until then. You know, I mean, that is the reality of where we find ourselves.
I'm, I, I'm sure that Mr MacArthur and Mr Bibby actually support localism and Liberal Democrats and Labour councillors and their leadership in COSLA is demanding that we follow this very course of action. They want to focus on outcomes, not specifically the inputs of teacher numbers. We think it's valuable and important, but if we can look at the kind of flexibility and see where that gets us to, but absolutely the arrangements will stay uh, in place unless we reach an agreement that has all the criteria of success and agreement that, that's been laid out uh, in that. But I point out again that the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats are saying something completely difficult in local government that they say in this Parliament. Uh, I, the sanctions, I have to say, in relation to the council tax freeze and the gun to their head is not supported by COSLA or uh, local no, authorities you, either. You, you've but, you've well, got, afraid, you have other opportunities. You have other opportunities. Okay. Go ahead. George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and Minister. Uh, I've been asking the... I think the NAS UWT set the narrative for this debate when they said in their uh, information that they submitted to us, the draft budget of the Scottish Government is in the context of West government's, Westminster Government's flawed economic strategy of ideological-driven cuts to funding. And that obviously gives us challenges that we have to face uh, because uh, we have accepted the result on September the 18th and uh, we're moving on as the Government of Scotland to deliver for the people of Scotland. So when you ask, uh, everybody we've had evidence from, the National Parent Forum of Scotland, Ian Ellis said, uh, is having 32 councils the best way forward for education? He's asking that question. Uh, ADES have said that ADES have developed a range of ideas that suggest a system-wide change provides a more sustain a sustainable approach. They've mentioned that as well. We've talked about some of the shared services as well, and I'm aware of the Clyde Valley model, which was uh, much touted during our time as councillors, uh, Minister, and uh, obviously didn't come to fruition. So my question would be, you know, everyone's talking about let's have the conversation, so why aren't we having the conversation about finding a radical other way to deliver and make sure say, uh, shared services work? I think that the government's been very clear that we want uh, public authorities and local authorities to be free to work across boundaries. Um, the, the boundaries are arbitrary. If you were to design local government, nobody would design it the way it is right now. It's a construct of previous Tory gerrymandering. But the energy <coughs> and years and court battles that it would take us to redraw <laughs> local authority boundaries, I don't think would be worth the effort when all our focus and energy should be on a kind of productivity and, and the outcomes that, that really matter rather than boundary disputes. Uh, so local authorities can work across those boundaries. We've made that uh, very clear. There's an imperative to do so. The Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy suggests more councils and more councillors, not fewer councils and fewer councillors. So the government's response will continue to discuss with COSLA and other key stakeholders, but it's been the case that we propose no boundary changes to the local authorities, but absolutely want to support that drive for change in terms of new ways of working, how we conduct our business, how we share services, how we procure services as well, indeed how we uh, involve people. And of course there's further work uh, that will be forthcoming on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill as well in terms of empowering our communities. But that kind of structural change that's suggested isn't proposed in terms of changing council boundaries, but there's nothing to stop directors changing management structures and how local authorities work with each other. And I think that that's uh, very empowering. But we would, of course, look forward to the committee's conclusions and recommendations on some radical thinking. But I can inform Mr Adam that COSLA hasn't brought to the table the restructuring of education along the lines you've heard in evidence as yet. But that's not to say that such a discussion can't be had. There is a great freedom within Scottish education to innovate and to create different structures. There is no one-size-fits-all in Scottish education. That's absolutely untrue. And there have been some interesting <coughs> proposals in recent years. For example, the East Lothian proposal of having a, uh, a hub structure um, um, in order to uh, develop local responsibility in education. I am very keen to encourage innovation in delivery particularly innovation delivery that could continue to drive up attainment whilst, uh, at the very best, at the very least, re restraining costs and possibly doing it more efficiently. So I'm very keen to see that happen. This committee, in, its, in the last parliament, um, spent some time looking at structures and came to a not very significant conclusion, I have to say, not for want of trying, 
there, there wasn't any silver bullet in terms of educational structures that would produce better outcomes for young people, and that's what we should judge things by, by changing structures. But I do think there's lots of scope for experimentation and for different models to develop, and I'd be very keen to see them happen. I mean, you know, the Conservatives have published a, a booklet recently, some of which I think, to be fair, is mince, but some of which I think has some germs of good ideas in it. And I think we could very easily see a bit of innovation, a bit more innovation taking place. And we should encourage that to take place. And I'd be happy to encourage that to take place. Um, and we should be open to it, but it'd be greatly strengthened if this committee and the parliament across parties, just as we did with CFE, when CFE was difficult, across parties were able to find a way forward, was able to encourage that innovation. Just to, on another point, uh, when we're talking about engagement with uh, the parents in particular, uh, one of the things that came up at last week's evidence was the fact that parents felt as if they were an afterthought in the budget process with local authorities. And I know that can be quite challenging, coming from a local government background as well, I know it can be quite challenging to be able to give the information when you need to do it. But they felt as if they, if they were in at an earlier stage, they could actually contribute an awful lot more. I think it was Ian Ellis again that says council should get into conversations very early with parents and be up front with them so that they could understand what was coming forward. And uh, I know from my own experience it was something that we also did as well uh, after we learned a few lessons. Uh, but it was uh, a good thing to do. And uh, obviously if parents are still saying that, we've obviously still got <coughs> some difficulties. I think that's a very fair point. A good local authority that's embarking on a comprehensive consultation exercise with choices is good practice, but it's still not necessarily empowering because the parents or the pupils or indeed the staff have to, be wait, have to wait to be consulted uh, with. The Community Empowerment Bill will change that, and practice could already change now, but that will empower communities to be able to initiate engagement and consultation on their terms, rather than necessarily wait for individual authorities to consult them. So that's quite empowering, and then allows that new mechanism uh, of uh, engagement. But that's the best authorities will engage early and offer people choices, and then report on that in a transparent way. Of course, the danger is then some people might misrepresent the choices that have been offered, mm -hmm. I would suggest, uh, and that's not helpful when trying to have a free debate around what matters and what's important to parents. And then they can make some choices over others. And, th and I think that's very healthy for, for local authorities to make the right decisions. Thank you. Um, although I don't usually walk away from a Rami, I'm not really looking for one today. Uh, I'm actually looking for, for a bit of help um, in order to understand this. And I hope as a member of this committee that I can contribute to some radical thinking along with my colleagues. And can I just put it on the record that, you know, we do want to work with government. I think at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We want pupils in Scotland to get... Uh, excellent uh, educational outcomes. Um, can I just say that, uh, that, first of all, I find the number of teachers, uh, of course it's helpful, but it's not the answer to everything. As a uh, member for the Highlands and Islands, there's some schools with 11 pupils and one teacher. Now, that sounds wonderful, but if you think 11 pupils and the classes range from one to seven, and that one teacher has to, you know. So I want to get away. Obviously, teachers are important, but it's not the only answer. Um, it, can I say to both of you, I'm very pleased that you are working up agreements with COSLA, because that's what I'm looking for. And as a member of the audit committee and this committee, uh, my problem is um, in the audit report, and I have to quote, there has been no independent evaluation of how much councils spend on education and what this delivers in terms of improved attainment and wider achievement. Uh, in the same report, uh, no consistent approach to tracking and monitoring the progress of pupils. It's not to say it's not being done but it's just not consistent between P1 and S3. And please don't think I'm asking for more testing. I am not. Uh, on page 19 of the same report, S2 pupils perform significantly worse against the standard expected for numeracy between 2011 and 13, and the same for primary. And then just a final point where I'm beginning to get something on attainment, over the 10 years 2014 to 13, 16 local authorities improved 
and 16 didn't. So what... Uh, I know there's not one little magic bullet, but what I'm trying to say, ask to make a, a reasonable contribution to this debate is, are you aware of where spending needs to take place within education? Where should that spending be focused in order to achieve the best outcomes for our pupils? Yes, and I think that's a very helpful contribution. And I want to be very positive about it because... You've picked up two areas in which we need to do more work, right? Now, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. The report was a very helpful report in that regard. The correlation between spending and outcomes is not clear enough in education. Now, there is to some extent inevitability of that because of the system in which we have. And a system, an education system in any country, particularly one with the history of education as long as ours, has grown up over a long period of time. And, you know, we started uh, with the system of parish schools, and what we've got now is that local accountability, but the local accountability is written much larger in local authorities. And that's quite difficult uh, because it doesn't allow us to focus sometimes as closely down as we should fo focus down on knowing what is happening. So I think we need to do both more in both those areas. Now, the context in which we do it, however, we need to understand clearly because there are things we know now we didn't know two years ago. First of all, we do have a system of tracking and monitoring of individual pupils which accrues to schools through three things. Through the inspection regime. Now, we can talk later about how that works and whether we need to do more and how we do it. Through the uh, national examinations that we have, which you know, give us both in an individual and collective basis an understanding of how pupils do, and through things like the surveys of literacy and numeracy, which we have you know, biannually, those give us an indication. Um, uh, certainly the first two do both for individual pupils, for schools, for local authorities, and for the nation as a whole. The surveys of literacy and numeracy is a little different in that regard in what it gives us. PISA then gives us a bigger picture, you know, which shows us not in direct comparison with other nations, because that's a slight misunderstanding of what PISA does, but it shows how education is developing and changing over a period of time and where the broad correspondences are. But it's not possible in PISA, nor is it designed to be an exact comparison nation to nation. So there are all those things in place. But we needed to drill further down into that. And what we've been doing with the attainment partnerships, and I'm launching another stage of that later this week on, on Thursday, is to go right down into the areas where we know there are difficulties and be able to, to, to attack those in terms of individual pupils. Now, those include, let me take an example in North Lanarkshire, which is a good example of the Bells Hill, uh, in Bells Hill. In the S5 cohort there, they knew that the attainment of the local authority average in terms of passes at higher was lower than it should be. But you're dealing there with, and I'm sorry about this explanation is slightly lengthy, but it is important, convener. You're dealing there with a comparatively small number of pupils, in fact, a very small number of pupils in, in that cohort. So by taking that as a, a, a one of the areas in which you know you need to improve, and you need to improve for those individual pupils because they need to get more passes, better passes, you need to do it for the school, you need to do it for the area, for the local authority, then you can focus down very narrowly on individual young people. Now, when I went to see that improvement partnership, they'd started with just one pupil and said, that pupil there has particular difficulties, and they turned out to be, very simple matter, how you, she had nowhere to study in the evenings. So they worked with the family to get somewhere to study in the evenings, and that began to drive up. They then moved on to 3, 10, 17 pupils. And by working with that group, they not only improved their individual attainment, they improved their pass rate, and they improved the pass rate of the whole school, and they therefore benefited the whole of the local authority, and by extension, the figures across Scotland. So we are getting much better at that, making uh, changes in, in microcosm that have big impacts in term, across things. So we can do more of that. And it is that type of work that we're trying to encourage, but it's intensive and expensive work, and we need to, to work on that. Now, we've got a number of other things. We've got the OECD examination of Curriculum for Excellence, which is taking place next year. That will be germane to this. We've got the publication, How Good Is Our School?, which comes from... A, the Education Scotland, and that is about self-evaluation. And Scottish inspection is based, first of all, on self-evaluation and constant improvement. Uh, we've got also you know, the way in which local authorities make sure things happen. And we've got something called, it's now called Insight, isn't it? Yeah. 
it used to be called the senior phase benchmarking tool, and sometimes things change all the time. And this is really significant. And I'd be very happy for members of the committee to come and see this, where the possibility now exists for us to measure in really some detail in individual schools what is happening and in individual classes and with pupils in schools and to compare it in two ways. Not just with, with the national standard or the local authority standard, but to compare it with a virtual school that has the same characteristics. And that's important in terms of the impact of the area in which a school sits. So we can look at a school increasingly. The school can look at it, not us. The school can look at it. The teachers can look at it and say, are we doing well enough? Now, that's a complex mix of things that are happening. And sometimes you cry out in Scottish education for a simple route to change. But Scottish education is complex in delivery because of what has accrued over many years. And I think all the things that we've got there are taking us forward in attainment. Now, the threat to those is a constant pressure on budgets. So if we can do better and more wisely in how we spend money, exactly the first point you made, then we'll get more out of it. Uh, just my, my final question. I, I take the point you made about individual uh, support. And <clears throat> what concerns me, and I do welcome the move going forward, I, th I think that's important, and I thank you for that uh, positive answer. But the uh, directors of education uh, in their paper to us today say uh, levels of support, uh, support assistance, breakfast clubs, study support, Auxiliaries, after-school care, sports, culture, leisure clubs may be reduced. They're also talking about reviewing vocational options, course offerings and links with college and removing management, development, quality improvement and support. Now, my concern, and I appreciate the, the pressure on budgets, my concern is that before we know exactly what does work, and the example you gave me does seem a very uh, a positive one, but, you know, before we know exactly what does work and where we should be spending money to get the best outcome, these cutbacks are happening. And, you know, it concerns me that we're just looking at teacher numbers and not actually looking at uh, the list of, you know, what I've just given. Uh, my point is that are we cutting back on the easy options? I think... Uh, lady said last week something about the frills or something. I, I, I don't think support assistance are frills, but do you know, my concern is that we're cutting back on exactly some of uh, the, the areas where we should be increasing investment. Well, as I said earlier, I think local <laughs> authorities need to think very carefully uh, how they take forward any changes to the education system. Uh, I do think that they need to recognise where the strengths lie. We're not, for example, cutting back on vocational education activity. We're, additional, we're providing additional funding. You know, the, um, the Wood Commission uh, uh, report, which is extensively about vocational education, is having additional funding applied to it. So I just be <laughs> cautious about a whole uh, range of those uh, of those things. Uh, you know, I, you often see us... Yes, I know. I mean, I know. I, I'm, I, I'm by no means good. I'm just saying, let's be careful about that because... You know, we often see proposals, as, as Derek Mackay has indicated, uh, which are floated, which do not take place. Uh, sometimes there are different solutions provided. I do think that we are pretty focused on the improvement partnership and the attainment work. I think we know that works. We're not skimping on that in any manner of means. We've been very focused on CFE as a vehicle for continued educational improvement, and repeatedly I've said to this committee we've found additional resource for that. So we are focused on very important things. But inevitably, where, when it is a time of pressure, there will be hard decisions to be made. I do think what we've seen in improving Scottish education, and we have seen improving education, we need to maintain that improvement, and that is the challenge. That is the, the reimagining we have to do. But I also think we know more about what works than perhaps we did even five years ago because of a lot of the thinking and work that we've commissioned and, and done. Very much, um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to explore some of the comments that have been made in relation to national versus local decision making in terms of the budget. Um, for example, Cosler states that local decision making over budgets and service delivery is necessary for the improvement in outcomes. Others uh, have mentioned the possibility of ring fencing parts of budgets, uh, a national set of parameters, and I think someone also referred to whether we need 32 local authorities to deliver education. Do we have the right balance between national <clears throat> and local decision-making in terms of spending for schools? 
I'm hardly likely to say no, we've got the balance completely wrong, but in all honesty, I think uh, broadly it is, uh, it's the correct one in terms of what's provided nationally and some of the safeguards nationally as well in terms of assurance and uh, inspection and quality and, and examinations and qualifications and so on. And what's local um, is uh, the school estate and infrastructure, the deployment staff, and of course what's devolved uh, to head teachers through devolved school management budgets as well. There's that further layer uh, of a uh, devolution as well, again within you know the parameters of of necessary um, expenditure. So um, that takes you on to the question of the 32 local authorities, and I thought I covered that in my answer to. Mr Adam, as to even if you were to redesign it, and I think there would be many good reasons to redesign local authorities, but the energy, the commitment, the cost in doing so, I think it would take our eye off the ball in terms of what really matters, and that's, that's outcomes. So the challenge is to be creative, to deliver those new ways of working within the existing infrastructure uh, to make, in effect, change on the ground. And you might say, but yes, the... The government or a panel can, can recall and reconsider a decision, for example, around a school closure, but it's the exception rather than the norm to ensure that checks and balances are there, that the decision has been taken correctly in terms of information and process and so on. Uh, but as to the, the, wide, the big picture on education, I think that the balance is, is broadly right from a, from a local government um, perspective. You know, local authorities, of course... Um, through COSLA may argue for further empowerment and that discussion will happen. Others may argue for further centralisation, regionalisation or wherever it happens to be, looking at some of the evidence that's been presented to this committee. But I think we can certainly have a conversation as to what works best. But what's precipitated a discussion is the financial challenge that we all face. But it's not the case that absolute money um, connects to outcome or attainment. It's far more sophisticated than just that. You can imagine, Mr Beattie, better ways of delivering that are more effective, more efficient. <coughs> An example in your own constituency, if I give you this, is the new Last Wade School, where you've brought together a lot of community activities into a single building. I think, the, the, if I remember correctly, it's 17% less space, but lots of things happening. Um, and it's open from 7 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And it's a more efficient building, and therefore the expenditure on a variety of things will be good. Now, you require capital to do that, but you've imagined a different way of doing things in the community, and it's been done. I believe that could be done, not necessarily the exact model, but reimagining how you, you, you deliver and perhaps how you make decisions at the local level there, it is within the power of local authorities to do that. Can I make one further point? Just around finance, just as a brief point, very important. School buildings are important as well. Previously, the only game in town was PPP, PFI, which tied education budgets up and servicing that. Now there is far more flexibility through government schemes, prudential borrowing, capital, and other ways of delivering new or refurbished schools. And that's just an example how we've opened up the opportunities to local authorities to be able to improve their school estate. Final question, Mr Peter. EIS, uh, they mentioned that uh, they would like to see a set of parameters that would establish national minimum requirements. And I think this is really going back to some sort of national staffing uh, standard. Uh, do we need a clearer set of national parameters? I would require to be persuaded that that would be helpful in all circumstances. I can see the argument... Uh, and I, it is particularly true where there are areas where people feel that they have got less than they need to get. But you, know, you might find yourself in a straitjacket in certain circumstances, which would be unhelpful. I've had this conversation with the IS. I'll continue to have the conversation. There are others who, who have believed for a long time the national staffing standards is the right way forward. I think it might turn out to be a very inflexible way of, whereas there will be better and more flexible ways of ensuring continued excellence. Thank you. Claire Adamson. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, good afternoon. Now, um, Cabinet Secretary, Minister. Um, in terms of the national performance framework and um, the part that it plays um, in education, um, what evidence is there to demonstrate that this has helped improve outcomes in schools and how does it inform spending allocations by both the government and local authorities? 
It needs to be seen <coughs> within the context of all the measures that we employ. And I'm sorry to reintroduce complexity here, but we have a system that's grown off, uh, up over many years, and there are many things that drive it. It provides part of the framework to allow us to work constructively with local government. It, it, it focuses us on shared outcomes, so we know the priorities that we have. Um, ministers are charged with, with delivering education under the Standards and Schools Act 2000 uh, it, and to secure improvement in the quality of school education. It's one of the things that allows us to focus it. But there are many other things as well. The, the performance framework drives the outcome agreements, of course. Uh, it focuses us on things we need to achieve. Um, but it does also, there are many other things. We need to be mindful, of course, of inspection reports. I go back to that. We need to be mindful of the uh, priorities, the national priorities that we set. Uh, we need to be mindful of schools' own priorities, you know, because each school has a, a degree, quite a substantial degree of autonomy, and has its own ambitions. Um, you know, but if we look at how we've done in terms of education, it also gives us some guide, guide to where we are. Our educational attainment, you know, we're, we're, we're maintaining our performance in that. Percentage of school leavers in learning, training, or work, we're maintaining our performance in that. And the positive dedication ones too. So even in times of difficulty, we need to keep in our mind that these are very important things. But it's part of, not the complete structure of how we assess things. There's a very final important part. How young people believe their education is serving them is very important too. I mean, I am more and more of the view that we need to be in there asking, listening to young people, and they need to be co-decision makers on how we deliver. I, I thought yesterday's event uh, that we held as the planning process of the, of, this children, of, the, of the Children and Young People Summit persuaded me ever more strongly that's what we should do. Uh, interestingly, um, a, a young lady who had done work experience for Jane Baxter was there. I was very impressed by her. Now, she is more than capable of, of saying what she wants to see happen and how she wants to see it. So we've got a com complex mix of things, and that is what Scottish education is about, is about making sure that that complexity leads to the richness of outcomes that we want for all our young people. Um, thank you. The Minister um, spoke about autonomy in local authorities, and they have to be able to respond to local circumstances and um, you know, be responsive to the local communities. But it was a concern of some of the parents' organisations, some of the evidence about a lack of transparency, and maybe um, not a full understanding of, of some of the, the um, benefits and some of the areas that you're talking about, Cabinet Secretary. Is there some way that the, um, the outcome move toward outcome agreements could, could make that more transparent for pupils and for parents? There should be. I mean, you know, I'm a great believer in complete transparency in these matters. There is absolutely no point in endeavouring to keep things from people for two reasons. One is it's wrong. The second one, it doesn't normally work. So in all those circumstances, this should be a transparent process. I want to see it as a transparent process. And, you know, the Scottish Parent Schools Parental Involvement Act 2006 was based upon that transparentness and that openness. And, you know, if we need to do more than that, we should do more. And um, to connect with your first question around the national performance framework, of course, that's the menu, that's the outcomes and then the indicators that local community plan partnerships choose and, and recognise which is most important to their area, and that's the basis for the single outcome agreement. So that's the deal between the local community plan partnership in its public service entirety, with a plan for place, local place, and the deal with government and the asks. And combining that, it focuses on measures other than, say, just GDP, but general well-being, really important to uh, our young people and the whole conditions and environment in which they grow up uh, and learn. And achievement and attainment is, of course, part of that and ensuring that young people then go on to successful uh, employment and so on. And behind all of that, well, how do you arrive at it? Good engagement, good involvement with the community. And as it happens tomorrow, uh, it'll be before the Local Government Generation Committee to look at how we strengthen the accountability and transparency of community plan partnerships so the, the community have a greater say in that and can hold people to account, not just education, but all public services 
uh, on the subject that you've raised around transparency and involvement, if people think it's flawed. And again, shift the balance of power away from the state and institutions to communities to be able to challenge at a point in time of their choosing rather than when someone chooses to consult them. And that may help areas where there's friction around lack of proper engagement. But not just education, right across the whole gambit of the public sector. Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, we've already touched upon the subject of consultation, and we've heard that um, some of the parent-teacher organisations are concerned about the lack of transparency in setting individual local authority education budgets. Um, could you outline the process that leads up to the publication of the draft budget, and particularly how outside organisations can actually contribute to the discussions on education allocations? This is out with my pay grade. I have to say this is a matter for Mr Swinney and, and Mr Mackay and them. I, I know that that does take place with Bestie. It's also out with my pay grade as well, I have to say, but since Mr Swinney is my boss and I'm in the portfolio, I should have a bash. Uh, we're in it at the moment in that Mr Swinney <coughs> engages with a range of people uh, out with government to make the considerations, presents the draft budget to Parliament, of course, and then we're in this formal period essentially of consideration and consultation around the budget. That involves the <coughs> political parties and other stakeholders uh, that, that, that will engage uh, with them. And that, that will include business and trade unions and a range of other people that the Cabinet Secretary would meet. And, of course, they, we then have the debate in Parliament, and that's, that's where local members uh, have their say if they haven't already engaged. And there's ongoing scrutiny of that process. But before... Um, all of that, it would be for the Cabinet Secretary to meet people as and when required, not least in terms of this committee's interest in education, local government, in uh, arriving at a budget proposition that Mr Swinney presents uh, to Parliament. So within that, local authorities would be represented through COSLA as to what their budget requirements, needs, demands, however you want to describe it, um, are presented. It has been the case that Mr Swinney has reached agreement with local authorities through COSLA on what's being proposed, and that's, of course, subject to parliamentary approval. And what's more interesting, I suppose, is what's happening at the same time with local authorities, because they right now are considering their budgets. Some may choose to set them early, but most will wait until February, once Parliament's executed its duties, approved the budget, the orders made by Parliament to release the cash to set the budget uh, to each local authority, and then they formally, normally, uh, set their budgets in February. So it's quite important to understand what's going on, of course, in the world local government, as well as this Parliament, arriving at a decision. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Could you sub that? Budgets are the expression of policy intention and policy activity. So to that extent, this is an ongoing, continuous process. You know, my published diary indicates how often I meet trade unions, which is every three to four months. Uh, I meet parent organisations. I am in schools on a weekly, sometimes several times a week basis. Uh, you know, I know the stakeholders intimately now in, in this area. So that would be a continuous process. It is, there is also a formal process, which John Swinney will lead in terms of consultation, which it would depend upon the issue as to whether I would be formally involved in that or not. Um, for example, on issues of student finance, I might well accompany the students if they were having a formal meeting on it. On other issues, there would be written submissions sometimes on the budget process. That's quite common, which I would see, but would be directed mostly at uh, Mr Swinney. And, of course, there's political and cabinet discussion of the budget, which is an extensive process, and, of course, um, I will be uh, in there arguing for what I believe to be right. Okay, thanks very much. Can I ask a question that, that came up last week? You were aware of the evidence last week we had um, an exchange uh, with the witnesses on uh, ASN, uh, additional support for needs, and the uh, evidence given, the comments made, were about the, the cuts to ASN, uh, but we know that from the figures that ASN staff have gone up, up by 8% over the last few years. And I just wondered if you have any comments on that and whether you could perhaps, uh, if you are able, to explain the... Um, rather confusing issue about the number of pupils who are so categorised as being uh, well, been necessary that they're in receipt of this additional support? I mean, I think that the rights and, and we have given to parents and pupils in this are significant. You know, and tribunals and other things do give a clarity to this. But let's just see if we can bear down on numbers. 
Prior to 2010, only pupils with certain plans, certain specified plans, or who were attending a special school were recorded as having additional support needs. That doesn't mean to say that they didn't get help, but they were recorded formally in that circumstance. In 2010, I was extended to anybody who was receiving additional support. You didn't have to, uh, have to have the plan or be in a special school. So there was a large increase since 2010 because we've widened the definition. And that was the right thing to do. <coughs> additional st staff are in there. But there are legal rights now, uh, and you know, strong legal rights. So I don't believe that this is an area in which local authorities, even if they were minded to cut these, would be able to do so because of the rights that can be expressed and are expressed by parents. I'm always looking to find ways to continue to help those who have most difficulty with learning. Uh, but I do believe in this area we have worked very hard to make it, make it happen. Uh, you know, 95% um, of those pupils learn in mainstream schools, and that's very positive. And I do recognise that the unions you know, have a, 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 an argument that they must be supported as well as possible, the teachers, in those mainstream schools, and we try and do that as well. Yeah, you, but you recognise the exponential rise in the number of uh, children identified yes. in this category. And I'm, I'm just wondering, given the, the comments you've just made, Cabinet Secretary, about uh, the rights and the legal rights that uh, parents and pupils now have in this area, whether or not, I mean, is there any kind of thinking or hint that that, that is what is driving the increase in numbers? Not that there's been a, a change, that there's more well, pupils needing the support. There's greater, greater awareness. I mean, you, you will find in any issue <coughs> where you know, uh, focus is put on that issue, where there is a, a, a raising of the profile of that issue, where legislation exists for that issue, there will be a raising awareness from parents uh, that this is an issue which their child is addressing and which they want help with. What we have to do, and our ambition should be, and we continue to have that ambition, to make sure that parents get what they are seeking and what young people need without the difficulties that sometimes exist in their way. And that's what we are trying to do. And the additional support for Learning Act 2004, which was amended, of course, uh, and we, are make, we make an annual report to Parliament. We are making progress on this. Uh, but, of course, there's a heightened awareness. Thank you very much for that. Um, the final question is from Lee McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Convener. This is um, slightly off the, the, the beaten track for this morning in, in terms of, uh, of school education. It is within your pay grade, I assure you, but um, it's, not, uh, it's not in relation to school education. So if you need to write to the committee, obviously, um, that is entirely uh, appropriate. It's in relation to higher uh, education uh, student support. Looking through the, the budget, I note the uh, net student loans advanced um, is £468 million, um, th this year and in 2015-2016, uh, but the cost of providing student loans, the, the, the RAB charge, has leapt from just over £180 million to, to £302 million. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether that £302 million does actually represent the cost of providing uh, the student loans. I think I need to write to you about this. The official who I work with in this, Andrew Scott, needs to give you the full explanation of this. So if you will allow me to write to the committee, I'm happy to give you a detailed answer. And if there are still questions, I'm happy to meet you to discuss it further. That, that's, okay? that's, that's very helpful. I mean, I, I think in terms of writing back to the, the committee, it would be helpful perhaps. I mean, I understand from the late student support stats that the RAB charge uh, on loans is around 29 pence, which would suggest... Uh, loans advance around one billion. Now, clearly, I don't think anybody's arguing yeah. for that. But where I think NUS are, are quite clear is that there is a case for changing the, the, the sort of terms and conditions, either raising the threshold closer to uh, what applies uh, in England, England and Wales at twenty-one thousand, as opposed to sixteen, seventeen thousand, and a payback period of uh, perhaps thirty years, as opposed to thirty-five years. So, I think in, in that context, if you could perhaps provide the committee with your thoughts on, on can I put on the record what Fiona has helpfully given me here? Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we'll have it expanded on, which is that the 120 million increase in the cost of providing student loans to RAB charges is a result of the consequentials arising from the 2010 UK spending review when higher tuition fee loans were introduced in England. Now, that takes us partially there, but I think we need a full explanation. I, th I think that explains the genesis of yes, it. It doesn't it does. necessarily no. explain whether or okay, not that's the we will cost. We will write to the, to the committee, and if there's any further questioning to be had, I'm happy to meet the member or other members of the committee. So, okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. thank you very much. And can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary and the Minister uh, and officials, of course, for attending this session this morning. That concludes our oral evidence on the draft budget. We will, of course, report our findings to the Finance Committee in due course. And can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave?
Our next item is consideration of three negative statutory instruments. Uh, they are convener of the school closure review panels, uh, Scotland Regulations 2014, that's SSI 2014 262. Uh, members of a school closure review panel, Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 263. And Royal Conservatoire of Scotland Order of Council 2014, SSI 2014 268. Uh, members of a paper from the clerk setting out the purpose of the instruments. The, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered these instruments and had no issues to draw to our attention. Uh, do members have any comments they want to make on any of these instruments? No? Okay, uh, therefore, are we agreed not to make any recommendation to the Parliament on any of these instruments? That's agreed. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as the committee has agreed to hold the next two items in private, I now close the meeting to the public.